This meeting is being recorded. Well, welcome, uh, councillors and uh, members of the public who have zoomed in today. Uh, I formally open the ordinary council meeting, 30th of September 2021. And I'll start off with a message about uh, wearing masks for the meeting. Uh, the protocol in the building is that. If you're a guest and you're in the guest gallery, you wear a mask. The presenters today will wear a mask until they've made their presentation and they'll take it off during the presentation and will sit down, won't need to wear a mask. Councillors, staff don't need to wear a mask. And during, and we would ask that if you go to the, the toilet or, or use the hallways, that you put a mask on uh, when you do that for the period of uh, this meeting. So, any questions on that? Thank you very much. Move on to the, the opening karakia and uh, Paul, would you uh, pick it up for us, please? Uh, yes, Your Worship. Um, and can I do it in English? It's, it's uh, completely in, completely up to you. Because uh, I do love the Rio but um, I'm just uncomfortable in doing the current here and in terms of all the meetings. When our Te Rio was being um, forced down everyone's throats on state television and, uh, and state radio, and I just don't think that it's having the right effect on the Te it's not fostering. So it's, it's a thing to be, so I'm happy to do the code here and then watch. Thank you, uh, a powerful message, and uh, look forward to this. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. It was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, well without end. Amen. 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 Move to apologies. Are there any apologies? Apologies. The declarations of interest and uh, sheets on the table. If there are any changes for today, now I've um, I've removed uh, my interest in relation to South Island Mute Master and um, pass it around. Move on to. Item four on the agenda. Uh, urgent items not on the agenda. Uh, are there any urgent items? Okay. Move on to item five on the agenda, which is the minutes of meetings. Uh, the minutes of the ordinary council meeting, which was on the 26th of 2021, have been circulated via Microsoft Teams. I've had no request for alterations, but are there any alterations? Thank you. I'd invite a councillor to move that the minutes of the ordinary council meeting held on the 26th of August 2021 be confirmed as a true and correct record of the meeting. So, so we'll we'll Deputy Mayor Carruthers, Councillor Davidson, thank you. Those in favour? Aye. Uh, I approve that my digital signature be added to the confirmed ordinary council meeting minutes of the 26th of August, 2021. We're now onto the action list and it's on pages five to seven of your agenda. And Tiara Cook, our group manager, will and acting CE will uh, present the actions. Uh, thank you, Worship and Councillors. In general, I will take the action list as read, but briefly touch on each of the items. So, in terms of the Cleary School Student Cycle Trail, as you'll be aware, the works are continuing um, down the Cleary area. Obviously, today, due to the COVID 19 lockdowns, in terms of that, we have fallen at the three, but the works will continue there. In terms of item two, that is on Council's agenda, will be part of the report later this afternoon presentation. 
I am between the Ross Chinese Gardens, Council of Schools are uh, working on the requirements of the application of a resource exceeded at the regional council, so that will progress in due force. In terms of item four, we know Dr. Here made a presentation today as well, so let's cover that item. Tamara Gardens, Council staff are uh, still working with the Tamara um, the trust group that are out there at the moment and helping you put the necessary information into the tender process. Rebel Street is as per the information in the list in terms of the items that have been agreed upon and being installed or implemented in the Rebel Street project. In terms of the Hopefinger Wastewater Treatment Plant, there was a workshop last week. It's my understanding that that workshop was constructed and went well, and in terms of the meeting of TVs, that they are progressing on potential wastewater. Overall, it's not the direct TV of that, so I'm not able to get more information. Um, in terms of the old Christchurch Road, uh, as advised, it's hope that we move on that will be completed by the 31st of December, and you may have some questions for Carl as part of this presentation later this afternoon. Item 12, in terms of public data in this building, uh, we're one for instance and that's underway, so when they're complete and there are costumes, we'll bring that back to council, and the same with item, item 13 alone. And in terms of item 17, um, you will see in the Hokitika Guardian as well that we're ensuring that we basically engage in an expert in terms of how about moving of the palm trees to the best of their survival chances rather than just picking up and maybe getting into some failure. So, if there's any questions that arise from any of those items, um, please raise them and we'll endeavour to add anything else that might not be in the update status. Thanks, uh, TC. Um, Councillors will come to the table. Deputy Mayor Crowder, right. thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Rich. Just by the comment about the the palm trees again, um, and um, given that the preliminary advice was uh, just the, the risk of moving at all, um, as opposed to the concern that I had was moving it down to the beach with the, the sea spray, um, should we be reconsidering and reaching the site basically, and, um, so that we're not interfering with those palm trees. Well, that is something we can take into consideration as part of the project and uh, get Scott and see what the options around that. There's certainly a lot of contradictory advice coming in. Yeah, I'm not arborist, I'm not a cloak. I just think once you, once you rip it out of the ground and it's on the back of a truck and you plant it somewhere else and next thing it starts to turn its toes up, it's too late. Very good point. Council Carrigan. Um, yep, I've just got a couple of things here. Um, the first one, so the, with the Ross Chinese Gardens, um, with me working on a master plan with the Ross community, that's still going to be some time off yet because there's been like ongoing delays with the Ross Chinese Garden thing anyhow. Until all of that gets sorted and the resource consent sorted and the lake levels are all, but there's, very, there's actually very little that I can really start doing constructively with Ross Community Group. So I'm not really sure if it warrants that still just sitting on there at the moment. Um, and the other question I just want to ask is, so do you know whether the resource consent has been lodged yet? No, that's what I mentioned earlier. It's all being put together by the uh, regional council. Yeah. It hasn't been quite lodged yet. And it is under all right, no, that's a good. And oh, yeah, you've covered where we should go. Um, oh, so, and now the Pukki Waitara building. So, because I know we've had a few discussions around, you know, what that's going to look like at the moment. Do we have an indication now of time frames? The only thing that I'm just conscious to to keep raising is that the lease runs out on the library was going to run out in two years and I know we're paying a lot of money to lease that library building so do we have any sort of an indication of whether we're even going to be able to at least even get 
work towards getting the library into there over that time so period? What we're or? waiting on at the moment is we've engaged uh, in project managers who are currently we designed to get around to get back strengthening requirements and the costings on that. Yeah. Once they are received, we'll bring those back to council so that the court picture will get the costings on that and hopefully along with that would be the project line in terms of the different phases of the projects, both of this building and the other that we've identified. Once we know that, then we're able to discuss the other issues in terms of where the library is currently functioning, whether it will be within the time frame of the current lease, or whether there may be requirements to extend on the lease. But before we get that information, which we are hoping to November in this case. Yeah, I mean, they're actually having a building this week. Yeah. So that, that is the intent to have that information to council. But council will have a foresight as to what they intend to be some of the use for the building over there, what that might look like. Absolutely, and you're having a presentation in terms of um, where we're moving forward with our meeting in November. It's the intent to bring some presentation in terms of what the use would be. Um, I just uh, one question about the speed limit <coughs> signs and when are they likely to be all installed? Uh, Councillor Kenny, it's my understanding that the only issue you're holding us up is the actual delivery of signs. So, like everyone else in the country, we're struggling to actually get the material once they do arrive and they will continue with the project to get them more. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mann. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Te Araha, for the report. Um, just a couple of things to clarify. In um, action item one, the uh, cycle trail crossing, the completion target date's October 2020. Is that meant to read 2021, or is that...? I believe it's not 2021 there at the moment. Um, it's not it does in the commentary. Oh, sorry, yeah, but in the status update, it shows us 20, uh, 31st of October 2021. Yep. So that was the original target date of 2020. Okay. And we were it quite some time ago. Sorry, it's it's actually quite hard to hear you. I'm not sure where the microphone is in rel relation to you, TC. Thank you, and it might just be also for people tuning in. It's just a bit hard. Okay, so that should that's really read then. That's an overdue action, isn't it? Rather than a in progress, because if it was meant to be finished in 2020. Yeah, we'll correct that. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, cool. A uh, speed limit question's been answered, and I'm, I've got a lot of transportation questions to ask our transportation manager when he presents, so that's good. Um, just scrolling through, it would, I think it'd be really useful um, to get some clear comms out around the Revel Street um, next stage as well. I'm not sure that the concept plans have been um, widely um, publicised in the media, so that I think that would be a good action to update the public on where that actually is as a project. Um, the wastewater treatment plant, I don't believe, it did have a meeting last week. I think that's been deferred until October the 12th. But please correct me if I'm wrong, and I've got and I've missed a meeting. But um, I'm not sure that that meeting actually happened on the 21st, did it? It wasn't the meeting. There was a workshop that occurred. Ah, uh, okay. So what? So the workshop was at an operations level. Uh, I believe it had the representatives that were part of it. You were uh, as well, yes, and we Simon, we and Ewan. So that was about just tentatively looking at potential pathways forward before the next meeting. Okay, cool. Thank you. And um, my only concern is the headquarters in Pakiwatara Action 12. I think that we need to really be looking at the feasibility of the council headquarters. My concerns that I've been raising for a number of months is that the um, strengthening costs of bringing that council headquarters up are going to be astronomic. And I think we need to be really looking at sensible options for the future for the location of the council headquarters. So I raise it again ahead of the, ahead of the full, actually knowing the full figures, which I'm sure are coming. Um, thank you for the opportunity to ask the questions.
Thank you, Councillor Hartfield. Yes, thanks, Your Worship. Um, I just think it's a valid point that Paul's got about the uh, the trees outside the swimming pool. It'd be a shame to move them and see them die. So, yeah, I think that might be worth looking into to see whether we can um, keep them there or not. Okay. Uh, Francois. No, no, I was just, um, Ryan asked my question was around the signs. When are they going up? So I'm all good. Council Neil. Likewise, I've had lots of um, questions in the community about the signs. So if maybe we can get it out in the media that the reason for the delay, um, so that people know they are still happening, that would be really good. Thank you. And um, yeah, just to comment on the Phoenix Palms. I don't want to see lots of money being spent on moving them, especially if it's going to fail. So my thing would be, yeah, if we can leave them there, that's great. And if not, thank them and spend that money on landscaping the new one. Thank you. Council Davis. Yeah, uh, just on the um, on the palm trees there, I'm just pleased that uh, Council have, uh, have made contact with Neil Challenger. Um, Neil Challenger, he was involved with... Uh, uh, relocation of, of uh, Pudakawa trees around town to along uh, Gibson Quay there um, about uh, probably about 15, 20 years ago and very successful. So um, I'm pleased that Council have, uh, have made contact with him and, and got advice from him. Thank you. Um, Councillors, uh, your thoughts about removing the Ross Chinese guns from the actions. Yes, good idea. The Ross Chinese Gardens. No, 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 no. Leave the Ross Chinese Gardens on there. It was just um, because the other part of what I was doing down there was that master plan of what the rest of the site, you know, yeah, will all look like. So, um, and there's no point in us talking about that bigger kind of master plan until all of the Ross Chinese Garden and Consents and late levelling, levelling and stuff was all completed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to invite a councillor to uh, move that the updated action list be received. Councillor Davidson, Councillor Neil, those in favour? Aye. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is, is uh, number seven, and it's a presentation on jobs for nature. Uh, Conservation Board and Capitia Skins. So we've got uh, Owen Kilgour here, we've got Mike uh, Lee, the uh, Chair of the Conservation Board again. Good to see you back, Mike. Thank you. And uh, Joy Connie, did I Comrie. 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 Uh, um, welcome to the meeting. Really appreciate you coming along. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. And if you could do it from the. So, good afternoon, Vesper and councillors. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. Um, my name is Owen Kilgower, and I'm, I've recently taken on the role of Operations Manager for Department of Conservation in the Hogatika District. Um, thank you, Chair, for introducing my colleagues. Uh, there's a few things to talk about today. Um, the Conservation Board. Jobs for Nature and uh, Cup of Tea Skinks. Uh, so starting with the Conservation Board, if I may briefly um, just talk to the purpose and structure of the board uh, before um, introducing the uh, newly elected board, board chair. Um, so the board, which let's skip the slide, sorry. The board's primary role is to advise uh, the department and the New Zealand Conservation Authority on um, matters within its jurisdiction. Sorry, it's, she skipped two slides, so we'll go back. Conservation boards are independent bodies. They're established under the Conservation Act, so they're not part of the uh, Department of Conservation. And its membership is appointed by the Minister of Conservation um, when those opportunities come up, they're advertised and people have the opportunity to apply to be appointed as members of the board. The board fundamentally provides the interaction between the public um, of the uh, 
in this case the West Coast at a regional level and the Department of Conservation and they contribute um, that local voice into the DOT context. So the primary role is around advising DOC and the New Zealand Conservation Authority and their main focus is our matters of um, policy, strategic direction and planning and they're heavily involved in review and creation of um, these guiding documents, the Conservation Management Strategy and National Park Management Plans. Now, what the Conservation Board doesn't do is get involved in day-to-day -day dock management or its operational work. Let's talk specifically about the Western Thaipotani uh, Conservation Board. There normally be 11 members on the board. Um, there have been four recent appointments to the board and you'll probably be aware three resignations, so those are current vacancies. And the Minister's intention is to appoint three new members within the next month. The board has a newly appointed chair, uh, Dr Mike Begg, who's with us today. And Mike has been uh, chair of the board previously. Um, if I may, Chair, I'd ask Mike to briefly introduce yourself. Um, yeah, Mike Leg. Um, in um, excuse me, Mike. Could, could you come up with? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. Just a, for people who are zooming. Oh, yeah, of course. Sorry. They yeah. want to see your handsome face. Oh, well, yeah, all you want. So yes, my name is Mike Leg, and um, I've probably been chair for about two months now. Um, we've had one full meeting with the board. Uh, we had one meeting which was essentially where I was elected, and then another meeting uh, a couple of months after that. And um, I'm basically looking forward to uh, getting the board uh, going, essentially. We've, there's a lot of tasks ahead, and um, I'm very keen to get uh, the new members on board, which uh, we spoke to the minister about on Saturday, to try and get the process moving. And uh, we intend to have a planning day in November, which we will then set the board agenda for the next year. Um, uh, we are waiting for the letter of expectation from the minister. The minister sends out a letter of expectation boards uh, once a year. It's been delayed this year, um, so we're waiting for that letter. And for the first time, as far as I'm aware, the minister is going to make them uh, board specific. Usually they're very generic. So when we get our letter, it will be relating to issues on the West Coast, which I'm really pleased about because it gives us a focus to work on. My expectation, um, and I've already made this point to the board already, is that uh, top of my list is the CMS and um, the Westland National Park Plan. And uh, also I want to get the board to work on section four of the Conservation Act, which is an important area for us to have uh, in relation to uh, Iwi. And um, I would like very much uh, to have to be able to work in partnership with the UWE, uh, on the coast, as we have done before. And um, I look forward to that uh, in due course once we get the board moving. So I think probably, you know, in a short sort of summary, that, that says, um, I'd like to come back to council at some stage and let you know what our plans are and where we uh, are heading, because it is important for council to know, you know just what the Conservation Board is doing. And, um, uh, and now I look forward to having that um, conversation at some stage. So thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, Mike, is there any, are there any sorry, questions of Mike before you then? Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, just, just one question. Wait, like the CMS, what's the estimate time? I would have done it in two years. Thank you. Uh, no. It took 20 years to get it before, so yeah. So we take a zero. Thank you. <laughs> My process for uh, reappointing the um, vacancies, yes. Um, is that an advertised process, or is the minister just going to be advised on appropriate points? Yeah, so um, the minister will be appointing from uh, a prior list. So, this year, um, I understand we were fortunate because a lot of people applied, and there are some very good um, people who didn't get appointed. And so, um, the New Zealand Conservation Authority and DOC have asked the minister to appoint off that list. 
And uh, I've seen some of the appointees and the potential appointees and they're exceptionally good. Thank you. So four. Thank you. The, um, just a comment, really. Firstly, on the, the CMS, uh, two years, that will be um, very much on the fast track. We did papper already. Uh. <laughs> yes, the, uh, the CMS, as you, as you pointed out before, Mike, was the, the previous one was glacial. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, the, um, the big issue uh, that, and that will really, really uh, rub with this council is the Western National Park plan. Um, which was um, um, underway and then um, uh, um, on, on that. But there are some, some major issues that have, um, that have come into play, such as the glacier access is um, now um, not what it was when the review even started. When the review started, there was foot access to, the, to France and there was... Um, 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 motor uh, road right to the um, to Fox Glacier no longer. Then, of course, there's the um, the big biggie, which is the um, um, helicopters, and um, at both townships, um, huge issues to grapple with, and um, so that's going to be a major challenge for the conservation board. Um, well, there are opportunities, of course, with that. It's not all, not all problems, but um, but this is uh, um, as, as big of a challenge as the master plan for Friends Township. In my head. Thanks, Paul. I, I, um, I fully agree that we started the review of the Western Park Plan last year, last time, and um, I see that we can probably run the CMS and the Western Park Plan in parallel to a point. Um, and it's intending, I intend to have um, a board meeting down for this year's uh, early next year. Mike, the, um, we have, we have a, a really solid relationship with Iwi, and it's a, a very important part of this council. Um, I'm hoping that uh, that relationship will flow into uh, the Conservation Board and that you can become a significant partner with this council going forward. Um, and it's very important, I think. Thank you. I, I, I would say the same. Um, uh, I always see it as a partnership, and um, you know, with, with all partners, you have fallings out, if not. But you know, um, I really enjoyed my time as chair previously. I really enjoyed working with you, and um, so now I want to sort of re-establish that connection and to work closely with councils because I think it's essential to get you know, for the coast, basically. You know, we've seen if you fall out with you, you fall out with us. <laughs> Good to hear you, Worship. But I can reassure you that um, Potani Night are very happy to have Mike back in the chair. Oh, we all are. I don't think there's any doubt about that. <laughs> well, look, uh, thanks very much, Mike. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Just very briefly, picking up on Councillor Davidson's point, um, the department intends to initiate that review of the CMS before the end of the year. Thank you. So moving on to Jobs for Nature projects now, and just very quickly to give the context on that, Jobs for Nature, of course, was a government initiative um, post-COVID recovery or for sustaining um, employment in a COVID situation, the model being that people are employed to deliver conservation outcomes um, through partners. So DOC and other government agencies administer that fund, but it's the partners um, that lead the delivery. Uh, there's a few projects I want to tell you about, um, and some of them are partly funded by Jobs for Nature and uh, um, existing projects are funded in wider ways as well. And the first is Aramura Street Strategic Waterways. So this is a project that brings several projects together. It's been running for a couple of years now. Um, and this is all about an integrated catchment management approach uh, for improving the health um, and the communities around the Arahura River. The projects that are running already are the Na'awa project, which is uh, led by the department. We have a couple of rangers appointed specifically to that role. Um, 
the focus there is around uh, reconnecting or connecting uh, mana whenua to the awa and also around the environmental health of the river. The, and it's quite a lot of work being done under that project around establishing baselines for the health um, of the river. The next one is a project uh, led by Marfera and funded by the Provincial Growth Fund. That's a four-year project. They're two years into the project now. Um, thus far, they've fenced around 14 kilometres of river and planted in the order of 34,000 trees. Um, in the end, there'll be over 100,000 trees planted. Just looking at how it all ties together, so on the surface of the bottom, we've got the two projects I've talked about already, and then two jobs for nature funded uh, projects. Um, there'll be a project led by Marfeta, which is really there to complement uh, the work done already under the PGF funding, and then another jobs for nature one, which is the establishment of a nursery, which will provide trees for this project and potentially other jobs for nature projects. So looking specifically at the Jobs for Nature project, um, you would have probably heard the announcements from the Minister last week, $3 million, 11 people employed over a four-year period. There'll be fencing of the waterway, providing alternate water sources for stock, which previously would have taken water for side streams, um, planting trees. The people employed in this project uh, will receive industry training in water culture and fencing. So eight land owners on board and they'll be making contribution of kind to the project. And then there's that nursery I, I mentioned, um, um, being delivered by the Victoria Trust and their leasing space at the site the south side nursery. The next one, oh, what, the last point on, sorry, on the Arahura. When this work is completed, it will be the first fully protected river for mountains. Um, to the sea in New Zealand. Now, the next one, the Sustainable Whitebait Project. This has been delivered by the West Coast Regional Council um, over a two year period, $1.4 million project, creating 13 jobs over those two years. And the intent there is to increase whitebait stock through enhancing whitebait habitat uh, right throughout the West Coast. And that's done through weed control, fencing, um, and also creating spawning sites, uh, creating channels, and removing barriers um, from fish passage uh, between adult habitat and spawning sites. The pictures at the bottom, that's Cobden Islands. That's an, that's an example of work uh, that's been done already, not under this project, but similar in Waveston Island on the right. So of particular interest in Hokitika, of course, is the Waveston Island project, which is a project that's been run already over a long period of time between um, your council, DOC, uh, conservation volunteers, New Zealand and funding from Westland Dairy. And where this project is different from the wider project is it's more of a concentration around habitat for adult white bait rather than spawning sites. The area it's covering is around 18 hectares. It's a mixture of um, council land and dock land. And there's planting in there, there's weed clearing and creation of channels as well. And the project's very much set up in recognition of this site being an important green space for Hokitika and improving its amenity value uh, through the creation of the dog exercise park, uh, walking tracks and the like. The next project, um, this is a massive, exciting um, project, predator-free South Westland. Um, that's funded from a whole range of sources, um, Jobs for Nature being one of them. So that's a five-year project looking to eliminate possums, rats and stoats, over 100,000 hectares um, between the Waihor and Potaroa rivers um, in order to protect the Taonga species in that area. And the benefits of this project are wide ranging um, from the fact that if it's successful, then there wouldn't be a need in the future to run large-scale aerial predator operations, removing um, possums, that's removing the main vector of, uh, that spreads bovine tuberculosis, so obviously a lot of interest to farmers, and it will enhance the southwestern experience and the brand. The approach for that is picking up on the methods used successfully by zip, zero invasive predators in the Perth River and rolling them out over a much greater area. Um, the delivery model, 
predator-free South West Limited um, to charitable company has been set up, um, and that's got a board of governors, um, the independent chair of Katie Milne and representatives of Te Runa o Makafio, Tōtahi Taki, Kiti Uru, uh, Next Foundation, and ZIP. Um, so there's a lot of jobs come with that, uh, 23 jobs um, from ZIP. And then Jobs for Nature is going to be looking at funding another 15 positions. And those positions funded by Jobs for Nature will focus specifically on ground-based predator control on private land. So getting um, a lot into the farmland there. Down the bottom there, those are just the, the partners um, in, the, in the work and funding of this. This is the area we'll cover. So on the right hand side there, you've got the Perth Valley where Zip have already successfully um, eliminated those predators. Um, they're working in the Butler now. And after that, they move into um, area one on the left there, which is South Makarito. And they're putting together a plan for the wider area. The area was selected because of its high natural value. The fact that there's natural barriers existing to stop the invasion of predators and and engage the largely willing community to participate in this work. So obviously the community involvement is really crucial here uh, because of the amount of private land involved. The next project, Sustaining Southwestern Communities. So this is something that was stood up immediately after the last lockdown um, with the intent being of finding a way to keep people engaged with their employers, with their businesses, so they can go out and do conservation work uh, when they don't have other work to do, but when their businesses need them, when there's visitors in town, they can do their normal um, work. Just a couple of pictures at the bottom. You've got Cliff from Glacier Valley Eco Tours. He's out in the Okarito Forest clearing kiwi tracks when he's not able to do tours. On the right, um, that's a group of skydivers who have been working on the Alex Knob track. So $3.9 billion over three years. Um, Around 42 businesses are currently engaged, which is around 75% of southwestern businesses are participating in this. So currently 114 people's employment is being supported. There's also a partnership uh, with Te Runanga on Kafio, which is enabling Mana Whenua to carry out um, conservation work from there or A really broad range of conservation work being undertaken um, by this project, everything from building tracks, track maintenance, um, weed control, pest control, there's inside work, people are listening to recordings from acoustic recorders looking for species. A real highlight was the rediscovery of bats in the El Perito forest, um, which hadn't been seen for a long time. Another project uh, funded through Jobs for Nature is weed-free weed -free Um This has been led by Development West Coast with technical input from DOC, the Regional Council and EWI. $3.3 million over two years, uh, looking to create 21 jobs over that period. And the focus there is removing weed uh, threats from natural ecosystems. And that'll be done um, through a contract which is being established with NBC. Now, NBC, of course, are a Westport based company with a work is occurring in Westland, but the majority of those jobs will be based out of Hokitika. Um, and Nati Waiwai are generously um, supporting that and enabling them to hold their meetings and the like at the Marae. Locations there, the key focus uh, for this work will be within um, the World Heritage Area and the National Parks. It's going to span both public conservation land, private land and Maui land. And the real focus is on these areas of high ecological value. Quite a broad range of weeds being targeted. I won't go through them all, but you know, there's quite a, you've got from pampuses in a coastal environment moving it up into um, protocarp forests and then the low alpine environment, such as Broom, which is uh, working its way up towards Arthur's Pass. In terms of the work that's actually being done, um, I mean, the starting point is surveillance and mapping where 
weed infestations are occurring and putting together a plan. Um, so knocking down weeds and where there's areas of high infestation and again focusing on those um, vulnerable ecosystems. And there'll be quite a focus as well on um, mine sites where there's you know, a large open space and a lot of potential for weed incursion. Final topic um, around the cup of tea scheme. So this is not a job for nature project. This is a dog project. Um, a little bit of background. Cuppetia skinks um, are a nationally critical species. There's around 300 individuals remaining and they exist over a very small range um, of the coastal strip in the Cuppetia area. Um, Doc's been monitoring them for quite some years and they're very susceptible to mammalian predation. Um, when Cyclone Fahey came along, they lost around 40% of their natural habitat. Um, so a decision was made quite quickly that some of those skinks should be gathered and they were relocated to Auckland Zoo um, and the knowledge that another cyclone was on its way and there could be more habitat loss. <coughs> so that's the skink we're talking about. Now, a docs had a project running because, of course, um, we can't just relocate skinks to the zoo and leave them there. Uh, so they need to be reintroduced into their natural habitat and because of that risk of predation they've been building a predator proof fence. So DOT's purchased around 1.3 hectares of land, they've put up this 1.5 metre fence around an acre, uh, so around a hectare of that land um, which is partly on the land that's been purchased and partly on council road reserves so that's been a, a joint effort that we're grateful for. There's a press a uh, pest eradication operation running as we speak to get rid of rodents within the fence and once that's complete the skinks will be able to be reintroduced into their habitat. So that's a, that's a really nice um, opportunity for DOC and Council if they wish to um, come together in an event um, for the reintroduction of those skinks. Uh, just a little um, look at where it is. So the purple area is, is the fence, and yeah, that's the fence itself down the bottom. It's a stainless steel mesh uh, with a cap along the top of it. That's the end of the presentation. Happy to take any questions. Well, oh, very, compre mm. very comprehensive. Just a couple of points. Um, the thank you very much for the assistance in getting waste and island across the line. That's something that. Obviously, we've been on it for a year and uh, a great outcome. Uh, I was in France yesterday meeting the, the young people there from SIP, and they're from Auckland, Tauranga, all around the country. And uh, we talked to the business owners, and they're really grateful to have them there, <coughs> becoming a big part of the community. So I think that's, that's fantastic. And Jobs for Nature um, has been the most innovative uh, way of handling a problem that I've seen from the government department. Very innovative, works, you know, when you talk to the businesses, it's worked really, really well. It's open for discussion, uh, Deputy Mayor Brothers. The uh, five-year project, $46 million one, to, to eradicate the pest and so on, presuming that won't stop in five years because in order to cement in the game you're making in the, those areas, you're gonna have to keep extending beyond those or maintain those, so presumably, Whilst it's got a term of five years now, in reality, it's going to go on ad infinitum and pretty much well. The real key to that project is around the natural barriers to prevent re incursion. We've got the rivers um, in the alpine zone, um, but there would, yeah, there would certainly need to be ongoing monitoring. I'm not going to claim to be a, a massive expert on the projects, um, but yeah, those natural barriers are the, are the key to why they've selected that and why it is a sustainable project. But you, you don't know whether it'll extend beyond five years at this stage. I couldn't tell you their plans for going to be Oh, cool. Thank you. Uh, Kill it on. Um, uh, Owen, of course, is, is no stranger to Westland, and he was previously, um, he hasn't pointed out, but he was previously the, the lead officer at Fox Glacier. Um, so we've had a lot to do with, with Owen over the years. Um, and um, so it's good to see him moving, um, moving up here now to um, bring that 
it's saying good attitude. The, uh, there's some real good projects that are underway at the moment and we need to start here. The, um, the Outer Hood River one is, um, this is a massive undertaking and a huge turnaround in, in um, attitude from the government towards the Outer Hood River where last century um, it was stolen um, by the Pojini Maito. And um, for 110 years it was, um, it was run by the Crown as any other river and um, until it was finally returned um, uh, to Pojini Maito um, into the North Island Corporation in 1975. Anyway, the, um, uh, and the river has been degraded over the years. You know, you've had the cows and uh, all, all of that issue. You've got uh, the weed invasion and everything. And so the whole catchment was changed over the years, um, that it was outside of, of iwi hands, and now it's come back. I mean, it's fully in iwi hands, but the, the, there's now a whole reversal of, um, of that um, uh, degradation over a hundred years, and it's uh, great to see. And it's you know it's a long term thing; it's not going to happen overnight. But uh, the end result will be something for future generations. Uh, and um, you know I can't uh, speak highly enough of that one. It's uh, it's just a great project. The um, sustainable white bait project is another one. But of course, that's right throughout the entire project. But the um, um, weights and islands. Um, uh, just one question there. We, we, we did talk about this at the Kotaito Kituru meeting. Um, but the, uh, the weed control of the willows. Um, so the willows obviously need to go. And they're going to be um, poisoned and um, whipped out, um, turned into firewood, um, which is great. great. But um, I just wonder if it's this be this is in conjunction, of course, with the local white natives, um, because they use those willows for shelter on a on a, on a, um, a rare windy day down the river. Huh. The um, it can be pretty windswept, and um, without the willows, it, uh, yeah, I, just, I just wonder about that. Or is it going to be um, progressively uh, progressively eradicate those willows? So I don't have a specific answer to that. What I would say is that the White Raiders Association has certainly been very involved in the development of the project, and the council will be uh, district council who are leading this work on Wadeston Island are hosting a meeting um, week after next, and that's where the actual plans of exactly what's going to be done and how um, will start to be developed. So I don't know that it's locked in at this point in terms of. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's, yeah, that's good. I mean, I, I'd love to see them all um, go down there and get rid of them over, over a weekend, but um, it'd be pretty barren without them uh, while the other trees are, um, are growing in their place. Um, yeah, and, and um, the other, the predator free south west, well, yeah, so we're involved with that, and um, you know, that's a um, very ambitious project. Um, with um, an awful lot of money behind it, um, government and private money. The Next Foundation is, is um, a huge backer of, of this. So something like, correct me if I'm wrong, Owen, um, something like $50, $60 million all up is behind this Predator Free South West. It's huge money. I think $46 million was the number we had on oh, this. Oh. Um, yeah, so and um, the, uh, uh, the Sustaining South Westland uh, project through, through um, Kaimahi for Nature is, as well is, has been um, a godsend for the glaciers. Um, and um, it's kept uh, some of those businesses, um, uh, kept the doors open. And uh, so it's, it's really innovative and um, Big ups to uh, Wayne Costello for driving that one. Thank you. Mm, um, great presentation, Owen. Nice to meet you. Um, yeah, and just a couple of things um, from me. The first one was um, just, yeah, so good to actually see percentage-wise 75% of businesses 
now actually um, being supportive with that jobs for nature down in South Westland. You know, it couldn't not, this funding could not have come at a better time, especially now with us going, currently going through two lockdowns in a lockdown country. And yeah, so yeah, that's awesome work. Um, the only concern that I have, because um, I think that's great what we're doing over with Wadeson Island, but we have quite a big flooding issue over there. So how how are we going to resolve that if plant we're going to go ahead with doing the whole plantings? Um, so that's certainly been taken into account in terms of that flood channel and keeping that open and functional. Um, in terms of the plantings themselves, I mean, the flooding is a natural process that would go through um, the plantings and we wouldn't expect them to destroy, be destroyed by it. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, a massive flood, maybe, but, but you know, we're restoring a natural ecosystem, a natural environment, it will yeah. do as, as natural processes do. Yeah. No, no, no. I just thought I'd raise that because, you know, over the years, obviously, we've seen that place turn into a, swim, a bit of a swimming pool. So, so we're okay. white, bait <laughs> white bait lover. No, I can't even, no, I can't, I was answer that quite briefly. You see about those natural theories of Kaikatea and other struggles that were growing on floodplains through the Wikimedia habits, silks, and that they should find. Yeah. 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 Um, thanks, Owen, for your presentation. Huge, huge amount of work going on. Um, and I just have a question around um, the other projects, not the Jobs in Nature, where um, the jobs are being created, I think it was a 13 and the White Bay project. Are they predominantly local, sourced locally if we can, if you can? This, or, I mean, um, for all of these projects, the intent is absolutely to employ local people wherever possible. I mean, the whole point of Jobs for Nature is around sustaining employment in the local communities. That's great, thank you. Council Mama. Owen, oh, thank you for your um, report and your, or your presentation, I should directly say. Um, it's great to see the work of the department and it's really good to um, have Mike here to talk um, from the Conservation Board's perspective as well. So thank you. I have no questions. I'm really aware of these projects and I think it's, um, it's awesome for Council to receive this update on this mahi. Thank you. Francois. I know nothing to add. Um, Owen knows my views on this. I've been, you know, um, out and about just thanking these guys so much for what they're doing. It's an incredible job and um, I can't say enough. So just, yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kennedy. Uh, no, thanks, uh, Owen. Um, just in terms of your, uh, the weed uh, free project or whatever you're looking at now, the South, Westland uh, Freshwater Management Unit. Um, your biggest concern is the weed in Lake Paringa. So I'd like to see um, maybe some funding there to try and tackle that. Um, I do have a suggestion. Paul alluded it to, alluded to it earlier um, in terms of the access to the Franz Joseph Glacier, and, and maybe you can look at um, using the high level tracks up the valley as the primary. Um, access to view the glaciers and um, the other thing is um, yeah zip yeah it's got its detractors um, I am every time I see Duncan and Ash I am kind of hassling them to give the council a bit more of a in-depth look at it and they assure me that at some point they'll request a presentation cheers. Council Hartrell. Yes uh, thanks Owen um, I'm very familiar, as you, as you know. Um, I'd just like to quiz you on a couple of things, and now you're an operations manager, you might be able to be a carrier pigeon for some of the businesses in the South Westland. Um, it's, it's absolutely fantastic work that's going on. There's, absolutely, you know, there's millions of dollars being spent, which is great, throughout the West Coast. Um, but I think Ryan and Paul touched on it. Uh, jobs for Nature is fantastic. It's keeping people in the town that work in the jobs 
But I'm just passing on what we're getting from Friends Inc. and everyone saying to me that is actually a business owner. The one thing that will help them is access up the valley. And um, that we're talking very small numbers to the numbers that we've just been talking on this whole presentation today. So I just wonder if you can pass that back through to the appropriate people. Um, the businesses are borderline, um, but their workers are doing well, which is great. The second thing I'd just like to touch on, if you could pass it to the what, quiz back to the right people, is when do you think the department is going to look at moving their staff housing off the fault line? We've got you know, it's a fault line here that is, everyone is panicking about, but we've still got our staff living on it. We need the we need the government to start moving our essential services, the fire brigade, the police, and um, and dock, or start the whole process going. So I'm just wondering, you know, there's millions of dollars being spent. And within that little budget there, uh, to move your staff housing is very, very small. So if you could be a carrier pigeon and sort of try and pass that message on to the right people, get back to us as a, even as a council, as a uh, business group in the town, if, you know, Doc are looking at moving their staff. Thanks, Owen. Message received. <laughs> Council Neil. Yeah, hello, thank you. Very good. Yeah. Are there any other areas in New Zealand that are receiving the same amount of work and um, projects? So, we, uh, so the Jobs for Nature program is a massive nationwide um, program. Um, I don't want to speak to numbers of our region versus others, but certainly it's a nationwide program. The area we have been a little bit unique is in that sustaining South Westland and that it was filed out very, very quickly. Um, and that timeliness of course was important to its success. So we were definitely a leader in that space. Councillor Davidson. Yeah, um, th thanks, Aaron. The, uh, they're just fantastic projects to be involved. I mean, it's a really exciting stuff like the Arahara project, you know, from mounts to the sea and, and the strategic waterways restoration project. You know, it'd be just really exciting to see the, the final outcome of that. You know, great work. And um, in terms of the uh, the Willow uh, problem in uh, Wadeson Island uh, jobs for nature, I think Mother Nature will take care of that one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Councillor Davidson. Look, uh, um, Owen, uh, Mike and, and Joy, thank you so much for uh, presenting. We'd love to see you do it again. It was very informative. And I mean, there are some huge projects underway. So mm -hmm. really appreciate it. And thanks so much for attending. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Thanks, Councillors. I invite a councillor to move the presentation from Owen Kilgore, Kilgore, Operations Manager, Hokitika District, from the Department of Conservation, and Mike Leek, Chairman of West Coast Type 10 Conservation Board, and Joy Comrie, Statutory Manager, will be received. Yep. Councillor Davidson, thank you. Do I have a second? Councillor Hart, those in favour? Aye. Thank you very much. Now move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the Waka, what's it, Waka, how do you say this? NZTA. NZTA. <laughs> oh, oh. James, James, welcome. And, um, uh, uh, James is the Director of Regional Relationships. Um, first time at our meeting. Really appreciate it. Really, really appreciate being here. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, you know, my name is James Cagle. I'm the newly, only three months in, Director of Regional Relationships for Wakakotahi, New Zealand Transport Agency, um, for West Coast, Canterbury, Otago, and Southland, and for someone born and bred in Christchurch, 
I have to practice getting the West Coast first. But that is how it's listed. That is how we do it. So West Coast comes first on my on my chain of, of territories. Uh, I hope no one here holds it against me. I have um, I have just come off five and a half years working for Fort Terra. Um, prior to that, I did uh, a reasonable tour of duty uh, with Peru and Waimaho. So I have some familiarity here, but I am getting back to grips with. Uh, this side of, of, of the Alps, and I'm really pleased to be able to swap out the top of the south and get this this part of the island uh, back. Um, uh, look, what I intend to do today is run through a sort of a presentation of two halves. I'm going to rattle through, hopefully at reasonable pace, some very high level, very large numbers in terms of the overall National Road Transport Plan, um, and then I'm going to turn to what that means in this part of the world. Uh, and with specific reference to the state highway network, because I understand you should have and you should be getting the, the local road side of things uh, from uh, from your own staff. Uh, but if there are questions and things like that, particularly as I'm new, if I don't have the answer, I'm more than happy to take that, go away and come back and, 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 and commit to getting you the right information. So with that said, I hope all this works. I might not want to press it. Oh, no. Does now. Excellent. Okay, so uh, COVID got in the way of the normal processes, it has, I'm sure, in many, many processes. And so we've only really just recently launched the uh, National Land Transport uh, uh, Program for uh, the next three years. We did delay it for a uh, for a couple of months from, uh, from the standard process this time around because of COVID. That created, uh, I acknowledge, a great deal of consternation across local government because it got in the way in many respects of the consultation that you were trying to do in your long-term plans. Uh, we do apologise for that. We were trying to be helpful and inadvertently became unhelpful along the way. Um, this was also an extra rushed process because as local government had been telling us and we had been telling uh, the rest of government, we are in an exceptionally funded constrained environment. There simply is not enough money in the National Land Transport System to do everything that everyone wants to do, even to the standard that we've been used to doing and setting aside doing new stuff. Uh, and at the very last minute, and I'll come to the detail in a second, at the very last minute, uh, ministers did recognise uh, that the funding wasn't going to be enough and, and topped us up. That, though, did cause us to have to take the plans that we had had, throw them out, add more and stuff. Uh, and, and, and do more work. So that has created another process of churn and a set of mistakes and an inability at times for some councils for us to be able to tell you exactly what we have funded for you. So where there is a lack of clarity, we will continue to work with you to try to, to, try to be clear. We've got an intention to, to be helpful, not unhelpful, but in getting more money for the overall system that has been, at least for now, a little unhelpful. But look, the National Land Transport Program, record, a record amount of money being spent recognising that that is in the context of very substantial price inflation within the, the, within the land transport sector. So a dollar today simply isn't going as far as a dollar did last, uh, last year or in the last, um, in the last three years. Nonetheless, uh, very large uh, funding across the country. But I have to say this to, to an audience like this, in this part of the world, it does, that doesn't shake down to a great deal of activity. There are some important project projects here, but the vast bulk of the spend in, in land transport in, in New Zealand is concentrated in Auckland and Wellington. Um, when you come to this island, the vast bulk of the spend is concentrated in Christchurch and Queenstown, and then Dunedin, and then everywhere else. And that's unfortunately how, how, how things have rolled out. And I'll, I'll get to why in a minute, because I think there are some things the local government can do we can work with local government to, to start to voice the consequence of that. And, and here we are. So we are a Crown agency. We are required by law to give effect to, to government policy. And this is the government policy we are required to give effect to effectively. So the, uh, the government policy statement on land transport sets how we allocate funding within the, within the National Land Transport Programme and effectively it boils down to those four strategic priorities. Safety, better transport, better, better travel options, improving freight connection, and climate change. If a program can stack up against those priorities, when compared to other, or, uh, other projects, 
then within some other constraints they'll get to, you stand a good chance of getting funded. In this part of the world, it's true over here on the west coast, it's true on the other side of the Alps too. A lot of projects, particularly resilience projects, my observation, have struggled to get high enough up the priority order when considered against those, those four criteria. And that's, that poses a challenge that's fairly obvious, I'm sure, in this room. So, look, significant investments uh, in, in particularly urban environments and public transport and trying to get people out of cars where there are the potential of building alternative options. Um, significant spend in walking and cycling across the country. Um, a reasonable investment in state highways, but I've got to say the funding constraint that I'll talk about in terms of you is, is equally hitting Waka Kotahi in terms of how we manage and improve the state highway network. Um, and you may or may not be able to spot the pin on, on, on my lapel, but substantial investment in safety, and that is set to continue in our years. Um, and I'll, and I'll, talk, I'll talk about how that hits. So look, just diving into some of the details. So um, road maintenance was a very clear sore point as we got towards releasing the National Land Transport Program. When I talk about the funding constraint, that was most clear in the amount of money that was going to be available to local government in the form of local road maintenance, and the amount of money that was going to be available to us in terms of state highway maintenance. It simply wasn't enough to maintain existing levels of service, let alone lifting levels of service to where we think they ought to be from a safety perspective, you know, and looking at the future. Uh, the additional money that we have secured from the Crown did allow us to increase the amount of money in terms of local road maintenance and state highway maintenance. I acknowledge probably not to the level that any local authority uh, would like, but we believe the amount of money that has been allocated uh, for local road maintenance should be enough to maintain existing levels of service. It's not enough, we acknowledge, to improve, where improvement might be, might, might be justified on a, on a sort of objective basis, but we shouldn't, over this three-year cycle, see roads deteriorate further. So there's still a challenge to be solved, but we're not digging ourselves a bigger hole in the, in the interim, which was the fear we faced when we gave you your indicative allocations uh, earlier in the year. Touch briefly on safety. So you will see when I turn to how the funding is allocated uh, a column called Road to Zero. Road to Zero is the national uh, road safety strategy, uh, looking for effectively a 40% reduction in deaths and serious in in injuries on the road by 2030. That is a substantial target. That is a very big lift and will require investment across a number of categories, not just in terms of how we, uh, how we deal with the road. It's a very big speed and infrastructure program. Uh, very big program on car safety, very big program on uh, on enforcement, working both with the New Zealand Police, but also seeing things like the transitioning of speed cameras from the police to Waka Kotahi so that we can manage it more effectively in terms of how we manage the road. And you'll, you'll see uh, in a second the, the funding uh, allocated towards that. So when we take that government um, instruction uh, for how to, how, to, how to spend the money. We then effectively pour it through a four-stage sort of, first of all, if something was approved but hasn't yet actually happened in the trust period, of course that funding rolls through. Then you have your continuous programs, things like your road maintenance, road safety programs. They get funded to the level that we think we can sustain them, we're instructed to. Then we look at the low-cost, low-risk projects, so the projects below $2 million. And then, if there's any money left over, we look at the new stuff. And I've got to say, in most categories, there isn't a lot of new stuff. Um, there just simply isn't a lot of money left once you get down to that down, down to that down to that level. And it's because applying those four priorities, we then have to fund in these activity classes. So there are effectively two types of public transport funding: services and infrastructure. Walking and cycling funding, local road improvement, local road maintenance, state highway improvement, state highway maintenance, road to zero, which is effectively safety, a little bit for investment management, and a little bit for rail, and a little bit for coastal shipping. These 
categories have grown substantially over the last few years. Coastal shipping is new, rail is relatively new. These are not things that, were, that we originally poured money from the National Land Transport Fund into in previous, in, in, in previous cycles. And the sources of money have not grown. So the money, the money available to fund this principally comes from your road user charges and your fuel excise duty. There's a little bit there that comes from licensing fees, and that's largely it. You'll see the dotted lines in each of those, in each of those columns. Those dotted lines represent the minimum amount that we were required to fund by the Crown this cycle. Once you take into account the things that are already approved in the minima, the truth is there's not much left over. And you can see for some of those, state highway improvements, uh, public transport infrastructure, walking and cycling, local road improvements, the bar goes substantially higher. And that's the size of the bids we received. And the news we were looking at in the middle of August was that we were probably unlikely to find any local uh, low cost, low risk. You had already received very bad news from a maintenance perspective in terms of how much money you were going to be allocated to look after road, uh, local road maintenance. We were looking at the same from ours. And we were looking at a very dire picture. Ministers understood and have allocated us an extra $2 billion of debt funding, so a loan against future revenue to top that up. And the picture looks a little brighter now. So the, the, the plan that we've released is a little brighter. You've had an increase in local road maintenance of about a million dollars compared to what we what we said we'd, we'd, we'd allocate you earlier in the year to what we've been able to allocate you now. We've been able to find low cost, low risk across the country to some degree, but nothing like what you've probably experienced in, in, in proportional terms in previous in previous cycles. And that's, that's about the improvement we've been able to achieve. Fortunately, alongside the loan facility is a commitment from the Crown to review the funding of the National Air Transport System. So there is an acknowledgement from ministers that fed fuel excise duty and, and road user charges cannot, on their own, at the levels that they currently set, fund the National Air Transport System to do what we all want it to do. So over the next year to two years, depending on whether what day you catch the minister, <laughs> there is a commitment from cabinet to, to review that. And I would absolutely expect local government to be a strong voice with two ministers about what they need to see in a properly funded national uh, transport system. Because no local authority I talk to, uh, thinks that the current system is sustainable. And in a way, if we don't address the problem, the loan we've just been given will make it worse because we'll have to pay that back at some form. And so reduce, reduce our future spending capacity. So, so what does that mean in Westland? It means there are a few key projects on the State Highway Network in Westland, but I've got to say on a, on a national scale, not a lot. So you'll be aware, I hope, of the work around France. We committed to be a part of that, clearly, and to work with the rest of government and what the rest of that looks like as, as the township is planned and, and, and we work out how to move forward there. There are some really key resilience projects on State Highway 6 further south. Uh, there's very strong rockfall problems that we need to get on top of. And so we'll work through, we'll work through those. Um, there is a really important set of studies on the Lewis and Arthur's Pass in terms of how we manage to keep those open or more likely to keep those open if the Alpine fault goes. Alpine fault goes. So those need to be progressed in the next three years. Uh, there are some low cost, low risk projects uh, important for their, local, for their localities, but no one can pretend that they are huge. Uh, for the Otero River and for Douglas Creek. Uh, hopefully, you know, things like improving the size of the culvert should mean that the road doesn't wash out when you have significant rain events. Maintenance. Oh, yeah, no, no, by all means. Douglas Creek? Douglas Creek is, um, look, I guess I had to look. <laughs> it's 
it's further south past France. Okay. Uh, as the state highway turns in land. Um, so in terms of road maintenance, now these figures, the, the 140, 149 kilometres is a west coast only figure. So of the summer reseal programme, which is about just under 150 uh, uh, lane kilometres of chip seal, 60 of those kilometres will uh, will be in this district and there's a little bit of asphalting and most of that is, is here. Uh, some drainage renewals, and, and some fairly useful uh, structure maintenance. But it is trying simply, really, and I can't pretend otherwise, to maintain the asset that we have now. This isn't about getting the asset better. There are some important projects that sit alongside the standard project, and they've been bundled into what gets called the New Zealand Uptrade Program, um, which, at large, like Jobs for Nature, was a COVID response uh, package. Um, and these five uh, bridge uh, upgrades, guardrail upgrades, you know, upgrades to parts of the bridges have been staggered so that they can hit the market in a way that doesn't swamp the market and, and tries to make to sustain uh, the investment. So I understand the last three, uh, the two on the Working south, the three to the south um, are yet really to uh, the one two are yet to hit the market. They should hit the market soon. And the middle one um, has started fabrication and securing off site and main works. You should see, uh, you should see uh, over this summer. Loads of emergency works as emergencies occur. That pulls from funding uh, from the funding pool. But it doesn't take money away from your projects. It comes from the comes from the, the, main, the main maintenance uh, pool. So um, all I've got to say is my experience of the last three months is we are seeing a vast increase in extreme weather events and a, and a very serious uptick in, uptick in the maintenance consequences of that. We just have to prepare for more of the same. Question. Oh, now's the chance, guys. <laughs> Dive in. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Council Dave. Yeah. Um, what, what you're sort of saying is that you've uh, there's, there's money there to maintain what we've got. And you've asked government for money to improve it, and government has said no. Government has said, if I characterise, well, if I can put words in their mouth, government has said, We'll think about how. So at the moment, at the moment, what happens is we get we get whatever money the system produces. So how much fuel is used, how much kilometers are driven through diesel, right? That that gives you a set amount of money. We figured that'd be 13 point something billion dollars in the stock. Then you look at how much you can do with that and you go, this isn't gonna cut it. Yeah. And so we go to government and say, look, the automatic funding isn't going to give it to us. Can you help? And they go, mm, we'll give you a loan and we'll think about how to fix the system. And so that thinking about how to fix the system is yet to occur. One way, and I'm not for a second committing because I can't do it, sure. do it, one way to fix the system, you could simply say, and you recall government chose not to do this part because of COVID, you could simply increase fuel excise duty, fuel gas. You know, that would pour automatically more money into the system. Government has to think about whether that's something it wants to do. But it's not, it's not our, we, we don't have that power. So, you know, we, we, we simply receive the amount of money that, that comes through the system. Um, so they haven't said no, they've just said, we need to think about how to do that. One thought that is out there, for example, is there is clearly, clearly is, clearly going to be more spending designed effectively to reduce carbon emissions. You know, if you invest substantially in a passenger transport system in Auckland, for example, that gets people out of their cars, walking, cycling, or catching a train, that, that reduces carbon emissions. And there may be bonds you can issue that will pay for that because there are investors who are interested in doing that. That would relieve pressure on the system 
with the dollar than otherwise could be spent. It could be spent somewhere else. Right? So that increases your total. That increases your sources of revenue. Um, so the government has to think about that. And my point to you is simply that that is a conversation that local government will want to be involved in. Can I ask you a question on the revenue issue? Um, at the present time, electric vehicles aren't contributing to road use charges. Correct. And, and the, the numbers of those, Correct. of course, is increasing. Why are they not contributing and why are they not paying road use charges to contribute to the cost of the roads they drive? So ministers announced very recently in the last couple of months that they would continue with the current policy that electric vehicles would be exempt from road user charges uh, in order to incentivize the uptake of electric vehicles. But you are absolutely right, it comes with a trade-off. Electric vehicles are out there on the road using the land transport system that they are not paying for. When, when, when there's, so we're, when, when only one, we're all subsidizing. We're all but then at the moment through the current, current funding system, we're all subsidising the amount of money that gets spent on coastal shipping. Road users are paying for that. That extra, that extra column that was added onto the side of that graph, that they don't pay, ships don't pay road user charges. They don't pay fuel excise duty. So there are, there are a number of those sorts of things in the system that, that are either implicitly or explicitly acknowledged. Now, ministers have explicitly acknowledged that, decided to continue it, but in giving us the loan, same time said, yep, okay, we recognise the system isn't working. We need to think about how to fix it. But yeah, you're absolutely right to, to point that out. No, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> Council, Neil. Um, yes, I nothing been proposed really for walking and cycling other than... So walking and cycling is walking and cycling's an interesting one. We received twice as many nationally we received twice as many bids on a dollar value basis than we had money allocated. So we have a minimum amount we are required to spend by the Crown. We also have a maximum in each of those category prices. The maximum didn't matter when we didn't have the loan because we were not only going to go any near the minimum or all but we basically tapped out. For walking and cycling, we have funded to the maximum and that level of funding is still only half what everyone across the country, your councils across the country asked for. So there is a really strong demand to spend more on walking and cycling, and currently our hands are tied behind our back. But none of that has been spent in New Zealand? Uh, no, I, I don't know about low cost, low risk. I honestly don't, I can, I, your offices will have uh, low cost, low risk uh, answers, and if, if there's a particular project that they're not clear on, I can go and find out for you. But so under, the t under $2 million projects, will all be low cost, low risk. And then so there, there, there may be low cost, low risk, but no no projects that are over $2 million in value for here, no. Yeah, and the other question was, and I thought about before, just Mount Knight's point down the south, something going into that area, which is potentially- I, I, will, I, will, I will take a note and find out. I do not want to put you This is a very vulnerable- No, no. I, and, and, and come back to, I, I, there are a very long list of vulnerable points in the South Island in particular that we acknowledge we need to get to work on to make the case for the investment because we haven't, yeah. you know, and, and that case isn't, isn't getting through the current funding system. Well, okay. Night's point, I'll, 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 I'll take it up. What kind of speed camera van are you going to use so that I know? I can't tell you that. No. That, would, that would be cheap. <laughs> Council Kendi. Um, yeah, just a couple of questions. Um, in terms of uh, the NZTA's uh, contract management, I read a report not that long ago that the far, five largest um, infrastructure projects were something like had something like $2 billion in overrun. I mean, look at the um, transmission gully. What, what are transit doing to, to rein that in? Uh, uh, yeah, thinking very hard about how to do it differently is the short answer, uh, is the glib answer. I don't mean to be glib because it, it really does matter because it takes money out of other projects. But transmission gully, for example, was a particular project construction 
that was, um, choose my words very carefully, um, packaged for us and handed to us by, by, by government. Uh, and um, I, I think there is a general acknowledgement that no one wants to no, no one wants to do that kind of project that way again. Um, and you'll see if you pay attention to the, to the, to the news, the issues there, there, there are ongoing. But no, you're absolutely right. Like project management and, and cost control within projects is, is exceptionally important. It is going to be critical across this next three year period, whether your project is tiny or, or enormous. I referred to the cost escalations. This is a this is a very highly um, we, we say tensioned, highly tensioned program um, where take walking and cycling, for example, there is a lot of demand. And if projects can't get ahead or get in as they were uh, envisaged and, and sized, we will drop them in favor of other projects. So so we, we have to maintain control on costs. We cannot let costs go up by 20% across this three year period and hope to be anywhere near like delivering what we, what we plan to deliver. So. Yeah, that's cool. And the other question I've got is this push to uh, rid yourselves of the special purpose roads. Now, we have one in Westland, the uh, Harsa Jacksons Bay Road, and it's the worst road we've got in the district. What's uh, what have you got on that? So I've, I, I can tell you how much you've been allocated, how much money has been allocated to it. I know there is substantial maintenance money allocated for that special purpose road. I can't comment on the policy decision to rid ourselves of special purpose roads per se. I, I'm aware of it, but um, all I can say is we need to work with you to make sure that that transition occurs properly and that the level of service for road users is maintained the way the way it needs to be. Right. I mean, it's not. It's not a. It's not a conspiracy to dump the roads and walk away. You know, to walk away. It's, it's designed to simply try to get out of um, having these bespoke arrangements. That's all. So we, we need. We need to make sure that we that we handle that transition correctly. But I, I know there is. A, I know there is. There is uh, two point six million dollars allocated to Westland District for special purpose roads for local for, for local for improvement in this district. So that's for, that'll be for that road. Uh, and so those are low cost, low risk uh, projects. And then there is three million dollars allocated, which was what was requested, uh, as I understand it, for maintenance on that road. So in three years. In three years. Right, eh? Sweet. Councillor Hartshaw. Oh, firstly, uh, thanks for coming along today. Um, just a couple of questions, I suppose. And uh, yeah, the electric cars are going to be a problem, aren't they, for creating funding for New Zealand roads? But, it, um, at least we find a at least we find a policy solution. Absolutely, we, we we absolutely know. But but honestly, we saw that coming fifteen years ago. Mm. We just have chosen government. Successive governments have chosen not to act. I um just. One thing about the Franz the Waiho River, um, before we lost the bridge, we had about four or five spurs on the north side above the bridge. And um, every flood, we get a big flood, and every flood washes the ends off, and then they cut some more rock in, and the rock goes in the bottom. I just wondered if there was any chance of, of reviewing what they do there. Like after the bridge was rebuilt, they put a constant wall up for probably half the distance that the rock is and it just remains perfect the whole time through you know um flood after flood but when you look at it there now we've got two or three spurs and all the ends of them are back down in the river and all that rock's laying in below the bridge and it slowly builds a river up which doesn't really help with the height under the bridge is it you know do you think that will ever change? Like, um, how many rivers in New Zealand have got constant flow stop banks compared to where we are here? I can, I can, think, I can think of a number on, on, the, on the other side, but nonetheless, look, I, I don't know the answer, but I'm happy to go and find out. Yeah, it's just, just there's a lot of money gets poured into it. And, yeah, 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 I know, I, I, I get it. Mm. Particularly if you've seen another way of doing it. 
Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, Francois. Uh, kia ora, James. Great to see you again, mate. Um, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I don't have any, any issues with it. It's good to, to um, have you here presenting it in one. There is just a question. I'm not sure if it's you'd be able to answer it, but it's just around the consenting um, when it comes to this road stuff. I'm, I'm assuming, does that sit purely with the, um, with the contractor or does or does, no. um, or do you have any influence in that space? No, it should be. It should be, If it's State Highway, it should be us. Okay. No, that's good to know. Okay, no, that's no problem. Tell me. <laughs> yeah, I will. I will. This is about global consent. Thing, that's all. Thanks, yep. mate. Yep. Council Mark. Good, James. Thanks for the um, report. I guess um, you're just the messenger for a, a lot of what's being told. So I, I appreciate and understand that. I think it's really concerning that the infrastructure in this country is crumbling and we haven't got the funds. However, we're wasting funds on lots of fluffy projects nationally. Um, so to me, this is core function of the government and to be under investing in roads and infrastructure like this is, is a huge mistake and I think it will bite us in the long run. Um, I think um, some things that we that have been touched on already, sort of the um, epitaph point, the sl uh, slip down in uh, Knight's point has been captured. So thanks, Councillor Neil. That was on my list. Um, also, maintenance, ongoing maintenance of our roads and the infrastructure that accompanies the roads corridors like uh, Waka Kotahi signage in Westland is particularly bad. We have a high rainfall and it gets covered in lichen, moss, mould, and there's very little done to keep them clean and to keep them visible. And I understand when budget constraints are there, it's not about making them, you know, we haven't got a lot of money in the coffers for cosmetic work. It's actually making them functional too. So. I, I wish I was in Hukutika and I could take you for a tour around to show you some of the signs I mean, but in general, if unless they're brand new, the signage, Waka Kotahi signage is pretty poor in our district in terms of the maintenance and upkeep of it. So there's a general comment. I think also notice that, in, and it's a really grey area because in Westland, a lot of uh, our towns have the state highway as their through fear or their main um, their main road, like the, and it's different because a lot of towns don't have that um, as the, you know, the artery that runs through all of our townships. And so, on there, there's things like um, uh, Waka Kotahi owned uh, roundabouts and um, uh, town entrance signs, gardens, and the like. And that is an, an ongoing issue with our council in terms of who's actually responsible for maintaining those assets and who will actually write out the check to get the work done. A classic is the roundabout in Kamara Junction. It's in a really bad state of disrepair. It's, it's, there's so many issues around that. Um, the Hokitika main entrance roundabout, no one seems to take any responsibility for that. And on and on it goes throughout the township. The entrance to it, to Wukutika, the ADK zone is pretty bad and is not maintained. The only maintenance that happens there is the work that I believe our contractors do on instruction from council. So there's a number of things that sit sort of, even though I'm, you're here talking the strategic, there's actually a lot of things in the operational area that I think need addressing because they concern our ratepayers and and it's not council's role to uh, do work on the state highway corridor. So I've just put that out as a theme as well, that there needs to be some a better way of us or having some sort of system that residents can uh, capture those sorts of concerns and have them clearly put through to Waka Kotahi and for them to be actioned. Look, Councillor, thank you. I, I couldn't agree more. And we ought to be telling you when we are. You know, so so look, I've taken a list of the ones you've mentioned. If you've got others, I'm more than happy to take them. Oh, oh I'm um, sure we could, between it's, us it's, and our transport team, we could get your list. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I mean, ultimately, that will be a question for, for our contractors, but it's our contract. We need to manage that, and we need to manage it in a way that works with your community. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right to point out the difference between towns that have effectively their main street or a main arterial which is the state highway, which is managed by us, 
versus ones that don't. You've, you've lost a lot of autonomy simply by having that. Now, there's a reason that the, 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 the state highway is there, but we have to manage it the way that works for you. So I'm more than happy to, to come back on, at the very least, to understand what the levels of service we're managing those two are, you know, what the standards are, whether we're meeting them or not, and, and, and work from there. So I'm happy to do that. That's excellent. And I think my final comment is around the number of one-way bridges. I think that's serious, serious um, issue in the future that we need to start addressing as um, modes of transport are changing. And the, those those roads were not designed for some of the vehicles that are on them now. And this, the bridging network and the age of the bridging network is, is going to be a real issue, particularly for South Western in the future. So, um, there's kind of a bouquet in the sense that, yes, we, I really appreciate you coming. That's really good to talk to you, James, and to hear from you um, at, from Wakakote. But I think there's also a long list of, <laughs> please please help us with these these critical matters and um, not waste the money on a, a sky path in Auckland when we could, we could have a one one hundredth of that and it would fix a lot of our uh, region's infrastructure issues. So thank you. Councillor Hart. Thanks, James. Um, clearly, there's yeah, an issue with funding, so um, that needs to be sorted. But Councillor Martin talked about the one-way bridges, and that was one of my questions as well, especially around the main um, bridge between, well, the Bailey Bridge between <laughs> east and west. I yep. drive it quite often, and um, yeah, I just think some of those bridges need seriously Look, yeah. So, look, you, you mentioning the Bailey is, is, is it's worth just pausing a second. I, I think, I think, I, I totally understand why the one-way bridge network is a, is a pain point. Um, strictly speaking, any change to that is, is what we call an improvement rather than maintenance, right? And I talk about how improvements are difficult to fund. Um, there will absolutely be safety issues and concerns and questions around some of them, right? Um, the Bailey, though, I think falls into a completely different category. That's a resilience question. Um, you know, and, and the ability to maintain that room there. So, as I mentioned, we are doing a study on that part of the network. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I will, I'll go to check, but I'm absolutely sure that it will include the Bailey. It also will include the viaduct. Um, the last thing you need is the fold going and the viaduct standing, but both connections to the viaduct going. So it's just sitting, you know. So, we need to think about how that will work so that we can then make the case for funding. Um, if we don't do the study, we'll never, we'll never get the funding. So we have to start. So, yeah. 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 Thank you. Councillor Cogan. Um, kia ora, James. <laughs> Just interesting sitting there going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, be, I, and why I do that is because when we very first started as the, uh, the newly elected council, back in our 12th of December 2019 meeting, we actually, one of the main topics that we talked about is how do we get on top of the roading infrastructure and lobby central government for more extensive funding. And here we are nearly two years later still having the same conversation. I'm heartened by the conversation from you um, and the fact that um, you see the reality of the situation, especially in small regions like ours. Um, we did, and I cannot remember who came along from um, Waka Katahi, right? And originally, and that was very disheartening, that conversation, I have to say. I went away from that feeling absolutely gutted because at that point, and I'm hoping someone from council can pull out those meeting notes, we at that point addressed 11 high risk areas on the coast, including Knights Point, that were of a huge concern to us um, and raised all of them, but were pretty much told that there was no funding to really get on to really any of it. Now that was two years ago. Um, so I would really like to see if we can go back and find, I know we talked about it considerably at the time, what those 11 high risk areas were. 
Um, that would be, be really useful. Yep, yep. Um, but, yeah, so it's more encouraging to hear you in your new role um, making the right noises to lobby better for regions like ourselves. Um, the other thing, though, that I will um, stress, and Councillor Martin touched on it as well, is our state highway maintenance is appalling. Um, I'm sorry, there's the, the boom, you know, once upon a time you could drive down our state highways, it was all regularly mowed. Um, I would only suggest to you when you're driving, if you're driving out of town today, to take a look at our signs at the white posts. We had a discussion on this maybe 12 months ago going, well, will we go and clean them? Because they're filthy. But apparently it's just, you know, under NZTA, it's their responsibility. Well, NZTA aren't doing it. And, um, yeah, so, um, and, it, and it still brings me back to, you know, the unfortunate reality that, you know, this funding, every time there's an increase in funding, you know, Auckland's getting some new motorway put in or there's something going on, you know, down in Wellington. It's always the bigger centres and there's hardly ever any focus on the smaller regions like ourselves. However, when I say we're a smaller region, if you look at the length and distance of our region, and compare that, I think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, the distance of like Wellington to 605 kilometers. 605 kilometers. Yeah, you know, so the money's going into these bigger centers in the North Island for lot length distance of roads up there, but not over here. So, um, yeah, I, I think. Um, you know, like it would be great now that you are in this role um, that we could make a point of um, maybe some updates um, coming through regularly from yourself on where we're at and, um, you know, maybe a presentation again in another six months um, because this is, you know, I mean, I've sat here now and I'm nearly, we're nearly two, de two years down the track in our term, and, and nothing's happened at all. So just to just slightly build on the, on the comment I made about, about maintenance, because I'm, I'm happy to follow up the issues. What I, will, what I will be doing is I will be checking effectively what our current contract requires. You know, are, are the contractors delivering what they're supposed to? Because that's a key question. If they're not, fine, we'll go and fix it. If they are, doesn't mean the problem isn't real. It just means we're not funded for it. And that's, that's what I mean when I said about maintenance. We've got enough money to maintain levels of service, not to get them to where we think they need to be. And there are absolutely parts of the country, maybe it's here, where we know we want the level of service to be better. We simply don't have enough money for it. That's true on the local running network, as it's true on the state highway network. It'll be a frustrating answer to, to, mm. to get to you, but at least then we've got clarity about which kind of problem it is, mm. whether it's a we need more money problem or whether it's we need to hold out our, our, our contract just to account problem. But to be fair, some of the stuff should be pretty standard. And, no, and, and, and absolutely. Some of the problems you're raising Mowing really are the side of the roads and planning the signs. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much, James. That's great. That's from me. Uh, Kilda James, good to see you back in these parts with a different porto. Yes. Mm -hmm. The um, yeah, uh, looking through this, it's a, it's pretty skinny, isn't it? As to how much um, NZTA is um, spending on to tie posts, mm. not a lot. Um, in fact, I, I don't know. I've seen um, such a small capital works program for uh, forward uh, to what we're looking at now. It's been paired back to bugger all. Yeah, so, so the reality on state highways is the money, the vast bulk of money for state highway improvement is eaten up by very large state highway projects that are occurring that way. 
And until they end and finish, and you know, they wash out the system, there isn't much money to go around elsewhere. It's the, it's the, it's the truth of it. Yes, unfortunately, Sorry. it's worldwide politics. Unfortunately. But, um, and so looking at the specifics here with the, um, the YO bridge, you know, I mean, that's really, you know, it's not, we're not talking about a replacement of the, of the YO bridge, which is what we, that's the place we should be at, you know, as part of the forward, um, the master planning for Friends Township and, and um, what the council's now talking about, this should be all part of it. And the NZT should be sitting there as a partner and talking about planning for the future for a, a, a bridge that's not just a patch up job, which is what we've had since we haven't had a permanent bridge over the Waio River since the suspension bridge was taken down about 30 years ago. And ever since, she's been a patch up job. And you know, this is still just continuing to patch up. In, in three months, I'm, I'm getting reasonably familiar with the conversations around bridge, bridge replacement. Um, all of the conversations on the same with Ashburton and elsewhere as well. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to try and find out exactly what process is going because you, you're right, Kotahi ought to be around the table. Whether we're able to actually solve problems is a different issue, but we ought to be. So. And the, um, the single lane bridges, um, um, but the only solution to that is not about widening them or placing them. There's not even a program for them. It's just about putting guardrails right. on. Again, you know, it's, not, it's just a, it's just a um, plaster. Um, and um, the Tartary um, clip-on for the cycleway, uh, I think, did I, did I understand that's coming, the one that's coming off the uh, Terran coverage? I don't know. Um, it's 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 been recycled. Um, so, pre yeah, yeah. Um, but again, that, uh, that should be part of the of the discussion with the council um, um, sitting down around the table with NZTA about uh, the long term future of that bridge because um, master planning is talking about moving the township towards the north, which is the Tartary River, um, and um, a single lane bridge won't cut it. Future, you know, so we should be talking about replacement of, of that bridge, not just with a, another patch up job with a, um, well, a recycled or repurposed cycleway, um, but a two lane bridge fitting for the, for the new township of, of France. You know, it should all be, I'm, I'm not saying in the next, even in the next five years, but I mean, it should certainly be on the horizon. Um, but I don't see it anywhere. I mean, this is all new to you, I mean, you're new in the job. Um, but um, anyway, there's lots, uh, and the other one, as uh, Council Neil said, is epitaph cutting is a huge worry. Yeah, I, I, I didn't mean to suggest we're not doing anything. I just didn't want to give the wrong detail of what we're doing here. It's all on the list. I just want to go back with this, come back with the specifics of what we propose then. Okay, so I, I will come back. I'll fire out three. Yeah, but the um, best advice there would be to go for a drive and. Um, pull your car over to the side of the road, don't go too close to the side of the road. Yeah, big walk. Yeah. <laughs> and stand on that stand at a safe distance to look down over it, and then you can see what the issue was um, and have a better understanding of, of what we're talking about. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. sure. Thanks. So, once transmission gully is finished, we're all going to be in clover rails, Jay. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> but are there any? Um, projects of that scale in, in the pipeline? Uh, they're they're, they're going to soak up such a big portion of the um, Without pretending that my answer is comprehensive, uh, it, it entirely depends how government looks at funding a large passenger transport projects at the large centres. Um, so you You'll be aware. I mean, there are there are still huge ambitions in Auckland. Mm -hmm. um, there are you'll see reporting today. I think um, very large, expensive options in, in Wellington, and I'm involved in projects looking at the future of tra transport in Christchurch, which are by no means cheap. 
um, how they are funded is part of resolving that question about how to hold the transport system. So this is a real long-term problem we've got. This is not we're, a... We're, we're a small, small remote district and we're going to be at the bottom of the queue at long-term. So, so yes, but in two respects, and, and, and they interrelate, but they're not the same. One is simply the quantum of funding in the system. You know, how much money is there to spend? And therefore, how far down the list can you go? So that's... Is Fed ruck enough, or you know, are they set or are there other ways? And then, then the other question is, and what do you spend it on? How do you prioritise it? That's those those four priorities. What I've heard so far from South Island um, councils is that resilience isn't nearly high enough, or clearly articulated enough in that mix. In the next government policy statement, is issued there would. But this has already said, and there's always a new one coming, but he's already said the current one doesn't do enough for climate change, for example, and resilience definitely has a relationship with climate change, although not exclusively. You know, South Island Council, very clear that resilience isn't, isn't high enough up. So even if you didn't change the funding question, if the priorities were different, certain projects would jump higher anyway and may get that limited ball of funding. So there's a, there's a dynamic relationship between the two, but they're not the same thing. Thank you. Well, James, very interesting. Like, I've just got a couple of small things. Um, the whole thing comes down to funding. Yes. I've raised it several times. The, the people who um, pay the money for the road are the road users. Correct. And political decisions are made to take that money and put it into electric cars, cycleways, coastal shipping, Without any cash flow coming from those areas, so you're in a you're in a declining situation for road maintenance. That's actually where the issue is, in my opinion. If um, if coastal shipping is is going to uh, require X amount out of your budget, and it's a political decision, it should be funded by government. Same with cycleways, same with electric cars, and that way the maintenance on our roads and our replacement bridges would work. Just. Just oh, I'll take a comment. I, 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 yeah. won't, I won't pass. No, no, no. But it, it, it's interesting just how, see the thing, how the system has evolved. Uh, what year are we? Uh, 16 years ago, I happened to be working for the Minister of Transport, and the system then, Fed and Ruck just went into the general poll, yeah. and some of that was allocated to the land transport system. And then, you know, a few years later, the decision was taken to allow all of that to flow. And you know, hypothecate that to land transport. So we've changed the system actually many times at the margins, and I have no doubt that it will continue to change. Um, uh, one other point, though, just on funding and constraints funding, um, because I was remiss, particularly in this setting. Rate payers pay too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, I'm really only talking about the portion that we control, which includes our contribution to your programs. But a lot of that you pay too, you know, through your ratepayers. And ratepayers, as you well know, have a limited capacity to pay. That's a constraint on the system too. Well, pretty comprehensive. And um, thank you so much, James. I, I will look forward to uh, seeing you again. Absolutely. With the checkbook. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, banks have ended checks. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan, do you want to put something you your hand up there before we knock this on the head? Just wanted to ask one quick question, James, and I appreciate you three months into the job, but back at that meeting, I think, that Jenny talked about in December 19, we raised the issue around um, the consensus from the council around the speed limits on the entrance to the Hokitika Township and the state highway them being controlled by Waka Kotahi. Um, I'm not sure where that actually went to. But it definitely went to your team. Um, I'm not even sure if we got a response. So it's another thing if you can if you've got that pen in your hand still to find out where the Hokitika Bridge and the in the ADK at the entrance, at the northern entrance to the town is where that's at. Is ADK too high, too low, too too fast? Too fast. Right. In that case, I've got good news. <laughs> I don't have any immediate good news, but in terms of that road to zero stuff. In terms of, and you'll be perhaps aware, 
you know, the rule is changing on how we change speed limits. But but speed limits generally are coming down. I mean, I don't, I can't tell you what, how quickly here, but but as long as you're not trying to move it up, that's, no. that's a much easier thing to do. Definitely. We could just get our contractor to move the sign. I mean, that's, oh, all, that's all that's required. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> now we're um, James, thank you so much for your, your time. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Thanks, James. I invite a councillor to move that the presentation from James uh, Cable, Director of Regional Relationships, West Coast, Canterbury, Otago, Southland, from NZTA, be received. So... Thank you very much. Those in favour? Aye. Uh, yeah, suggestion. Uh, a break for 15 minutes? Uh, or alternatively, a resolution to uh, extend, because we, we have a two hour time on the meeting, and we have to extend it. Um, we, we, could, we could get a coffee and come back to it. Would that be suitable? So we'll, we'll adjourn, adjourn the meeting for um, 10 minutes? Yep. Grab a coffee, and uh, we'll. We'll come back and the next item on the agenda is the cream cakes and chocolates. We've got <laughs> our cream cakes out there today. Oh, really? Yeah, cream cakes. <laughs> <laughs>
we'll look into it. Um, thank you, Your Worship, uh, councillors. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, a bit of a bit of an update on where we're at, what we're doing um, in the transportation uh, side of things. Um, Sorry about that. Um, so there's a number of topics that we'll be covering off today. Um, primarily, firstly, changes in temporary traffic management uh, requirements. That's a fairly uh, new development, fairly uh, wide-reaching implications. A uh, bit of an update on our West Coast Council's transport program business case. Uh, the roading asset management uh, data score. Um, cover that off later. Bit of analysis on our what we proposed for our national land transport program funding versus what we actually received in the end. Uh, some forward works programming updates. And uh, lastly, uh, an update on changes in speed management and speed limits around the uh, country. So, temporary traffic management is undergoing quite a few changes or has undergone quite a few changes um, lately. Uh, as a result, uh, we recently joined the uh, Road Corridor uh, Collective, um, which is a, a group of like minded. Uh, councils, RCAs um, that are a bit concerned about what's going on uh, with regards to the changes. When the original code of practice was developed many years ago, um, there was little thought to local roads. So there was an update created uh, called the Local Roads Supplement, which then became part of the code of practice later on. Um, the changes uh, that are coming through don't necessarily uh, affect that, but they affect how we implement traffic management, who can implement traffic management, and the overall cost of traffic management. Um, so that, at, at this stage, they're already having an effect on um, the activities that we carry out. Uh, just as a as, as an idea, the traffic management plans, as it stands at the start of the year, can no longer officially be approved by a uh, site traffic management supervisor, which is somebody with, or sorry, can no longer be prepared by a site traffic management supervisor, which is somebody with my qualifications, uh, who's been trained through the industry and could write and prepare and submit traffic management plans for approval. They now have to be provided by a temporary traffic management planner. There's another level of uh, skilling that's required, which is a, a cost on the industry. At this stage, there's not enough certified people in the industry for that to carry on. Uh, so we've had to implement some changes in, in terms of how we act. We still approve and receive traffic management plans from people that are uh, at the original qualification. Moving forward, that may become less um, permitted. Um, at the moment, it's, it's allowed because we've got uh, a, a, a lower level of qualified people in the, in the industry. Um, so staff at WDC hold what's called an STMS ticket, which is a site traffic management specialist certificate. That gives us the ability to receive and approve traffic management plans. Um, ours are non-practicing, so we don't actually go out on the road and set the traffic management up. If we were to be a practicing STMS, we would have to go through another certification process now that goes and assesses our capabilities from start at the workshop through to take down and return to the workshop. It's a full assessment. It takes a full day to carry out. There's a number of sites that have to be set up and disestablished. Um, and if anything is done incorrectly uh, or left out in that process, you've got to redo it. 
the whole thing again. And it's a, it's a significant cost on the industry. Previously, contractors would have um, staff qualified to that level who could go out, do their traffic management, set their sites up, take the sites down. Nothing was an issue. However, there have been some issues with deaths, serious injuries on roadwork sites. The method for correcting that has been the changes to the system that have come forward. However, it doesn't always suit most networks. Um, it's quite suited to the state highway network or busy road networks, but lower volume local roads is not particularly well suited to it. So it makes it quite restrictive in what we can do, what we do, how we do it. Um, volunteer organisations are also going to suffer the consequences of this as well. Um, because there will be traffic management that they will be required to provide. An example of that might be a, a cycling club who've had somebody with the right qualifications to produce the plans that they need for their events. They can run their own events. They will, nothing really goes wrong with those. They get the plans through. Now, they're going to have to have somebody that's planner approved to be able to write and submit traffic management plans. And it's, it's, it's unlikely that these groups will be able to financially afford to get somebody certified. Um, in a lot of cases, it's been uh, people that within the clubs that have been certified by the contracting industry because that's where they've worked in the past or they're in that, involved in that area. The contracting industry are not going to get everybody certified to that level either. So there's an extra level of cost that's going to come into this and there's going to be a lot of restrictions um, as a result of as a result of that. So excuse me, Charles, did we have the opportunity to input into these changes at all? There was uh, limited amounts of opportunity to put, um, to put some feedback in. We said we put some feedback in, uh, but it was largely ignored. Uh, there was a number of other uh, groups that, that fed back in. Part of the, um, the Road Corridor Collective initiative is to try and lobby some of these changes back. Uh, so at the moment, they're, they're setting up a steering team. We've offered the uh, services of one of our officers uh, to be involved in that so that we're in a, at a, at a ground, ground floor level to try and steer things back in the right direction away from where it's going at the moment. So what legislation has been passed to bring this about? So the legislation itself is really just been, is, is the code of practice that's been created and, and amended. It's, uh, it's, it's not specifically a, a, an act or a piece of legislation, but it is a tool that we are required to use and work so if use it as a guiding document for how we do traffic management around the country. So there's no so legislation has not changed? The legislation itself hasn't changed, but the rules and the code of practice have changed. So it's an industry code of practice, which so is it's an industry governed, governed by largely the transport agency and the road controlling authorities. So, so it's been changed by the bureaucrats, not by yeah, politicians. It's just, yeah, it's not a it's not a political change, it's a bureaucratic change. Yeah, because, sorry, because I'm just yeah. thinking, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind when you said that, because it's been a, a topic of discussion at our lost community meetings, because of course when they have funerals down there, they yeah. use people like Wayne um, Legal, and that, that already had, I mean, it was already costing him three yeah. or four grand a year, I yeah. think, but he ran it under his business, but yeah. they were doing their way, you know, those funeral managements on the roadway. What, you know, I mean, that's going to have significant impact even on them. And, and we're already struggling with, you know, like things like the Canary Triathlon and all of these. All of, all of those events are going to be affected by these changes. So yeah, I'm just trying to understand where the, where, where's the legislation driving this? Like an industry body can't do this. Who else? Add another one. What happens if you don't? Right. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's happening is WorkSafe are taking a more active and 
involvement uh, and, and interest in this, and look at using the changes uh, in, a, in a lot stronger way. So largely, the, the changes largely are around um, certification of individuals for, for providing services, but it brings a significant cost to get that certification. Um, you could argue that perhaps some of that certification is not necessary. If I use my example, I've been involved with traffic management for five years, since it started, really, in its present form. I've got that much experience for writing and reviewing and approving traffic management plans. Now, I recently went through and renewed my certificate, but under the new rules, I can now no longer write and prepare a traffic management plan. I can still approve one at the moment, and there are changes afoot in terms of getting a certification to be able to approve traffic management plans. I've, I mean, I've provided feedback into, into the traffic management issues nationally for, for quite some time, and it's been recently well done, but now, the direction that it's taking is quite disturbing. But who's who's driving? Like, mm -hmm. You're talking about so so um, health and safety taking decreased interest. With who's who's driving? Who are we dealing with? The guiding, the guiding document is primarily produced by the transport agency by NZTA. Yeah, yeah. Yep. he just walked out the door. He would know the building, he would know. I've seen some similarities with the building industry yeah. as well, and it's the same sort of thing where it's getting harder and harder, and it's costing more and more and more, yeah. and not. Well, it's it's becoming, it is becoming quite common for that sort of change to happen, um, and, it, and it, is, it is making it very difficult. Um, to work. The, the mm -hmm. jobs, are going to, uh, sorry, jobs are going to become more expensive to do because of traffic management. We, we might have a job that's going to cost $1,000 to do, but it might cost us two or $3,000 for traffic management. I think it's community works a little better. Yeah. Council of Mark, put your hand up there. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Carl, just on this point, um, I'm just curious as to what this means pragmatically for, um, like, in terms of our ongoing road maintenance and stuff, that all complies under, like, a standard traffic management procedure, doesn't it? So there's just, there's a uh, widely accepted um, uh, plan that our contractors work to. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. The, the contracting industry, the larger uh, players, have, have mostly already complied and have people uh, certified to the required level. Cool. Um, so there, are, there are still some of their existing staff that are likely to suffer and may, may not be able to do some of the traffic management themselves. Um, this is this is where it gets quite quite difficult in terms of the, the type of roads that are that are looked at. So, uh, 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 practicing STMS can set out and establish a traffic management site on pretty much any any road. Um, at the prior to the changes, uh, a traffic controller could set up. A site much the, in the same way. Um, with the changes going ahead, a traffic controller will only be able to set up a site if it's outside of the traffic lane on the road. So if it's off the edge of the seal, off the shoulder, they can set something up. If it's in an urban situation and there's an edge line down the road, they can set something up up to the edge line, but they cannot go across the edge line. You could have the exact same road, but with no edge line, and that person can then no longer set up a site. It has to go to the next level up. This is, this is how funny some of these changes are, and many in the industry are still struggling to get their heads around what the implications are. So my question is around the likes of um, the one-offs, the Anzac Day Parade, the Christmas Parade, the 
you know, those sorts of events that happen throughout our district and that are really prepared by volunteers and, and uh, sort of supported by our contractors, Westroads and yourselves, is they are the real, they are the groups that will need the most support in terms of uh, access to someone that can do this work. That, that's correct, that's correct. And in most cases, we would refer people through to the contractor who will have um, that level of, of skill and, and experience required. Um, in past, we've done that sort of thing ourselves in-house. Uh, moving forward, we won't have that ability unless we get somebody else certified and, and doing that sort of thing. But it's, it's, a, it's a type of certification where you really need to be quite active in it all of the time to keep current and up to play. So it's not necessarily something that would be appropriate for our organisation. So in Westland, who has their ticket? Who could do it? Um, there is a staff member at uh, West Roads um, who has their ticket. I, I don't recall her name at the moment. She's relatively new uh, onto the team. <laughs> When did all of this come into effect? Because do you know what? Like I'm I'm doing the surprise look because this is a very surprise look just hearing about this today. How well publicized has this been? Because I would think that this would be the same shock face of many New Zealanders it, when this actually is put out into as public knowledge. It hasn't which, been very publicized. No. Something that the the industry has been dealing with internally up until the point. Um, we've, we haven't been able to get a huge amount of information ourselves until we recently did our recertifications, which was in, in August. Yeah. Um, and that's when a lot of the, uh, the major changes and, and uh, things were, were revealed to us. We knew there was an amount of change, but exactly how it was going to work was a bit unclear all the way through the process. Well, look, clearly, um, yeah, we, we need to understand um, uh, whether this is someone's good idea or whether it's backed by legislation or more. So, uh, um, Council Kennedy. Yeah, sorry, Carl, has there been any changes um, in terms of how a site is um, set up? Uh, no, generally the sites are set up the same way. It's just who can set them up is changing. So uh, there's no, so there's no changes to how the sites are set up. There's no changes to uh, the signage required or the road cones or anything. The only change is to a piece of paper. Is that correct? The only changes are around competency assessments, effectively. So the staff that are actually doing the set up and take down. But there's, there's thousands of people out there that are actually moving out of this industry as a result of the changes. It's scaring people away. Um, that, that's a very real um, thing that's happening at the moment. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I just think it's total crap. Yeah. Yep. Can we? I think we should move forward. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we, we can uh, talk about that for quite some time. So, going on to the um, our transport program um, business case. So, this was the um, the document that um, that uh, you reviewed and uh, we submitted uh, for our national land transport program in December. Uh, 2020. So it was a collaborative effort between the three councils. Uh, just an update on that. Uh, I got word just before the lockdown that uh, it's been nominated as a finalist in the uh, Institute of Professional Works Engineers Australasia New Zealand Asset Management Excellence Awards. Now that was going to be held in September, uh, but of course COVID. Uh, and it's now been uh, rescheduled to February. That's uh, part of a conference that's, uh, that they held, hold every year, and the award ceremony is, is carried out at that conference. So it's a, it's a nice, uh, nice bit of feedback for us in terms of what we've produced and what we've put together. Um, it gave us a good sense of confidence that we're actually doing 
uh, good things um, in that uh, in that sector. So, touching on going on from that, we've got our asset management data score. So, this is something that is produced annually through a performance uh, management and reporting tool that has been developed by uh, Roading Efficiency Group, um, Local Government New Zealand and Transport Agency. Now that looks at what we've been doing in the roading sector, looks at our loading database, um, what changes we've been making in there, what work we've been carrying out in our uh, it looks at our annual returns and reports. Um, and we, we've been aiming in the last uh, last training for a, uh, for a score of around about 80. It's been a target that we've, uh, we've been looking towards. Last year we, we were quite well down, uh, simply because there hadn't been a lot of maintenance and work carried out within our database. Um, as a result of uh, extra efforts that we've put in, uh, we've, we've secured a score of 77, which is not far off where we where we needed it to be. Carl, can you explain what the so score of? What, what are you scoring? It's it's a it's a it's it looks at about 34 different metrics um, across the across the range. So it looks at our looks at our annual annual reports in terms of what we've uh, said we were going to do versus what we've done, what we've achieved. Um, it's looking at the quality of the data in the database, the amount of work that we're doing, uh, improvements in our roading database, which is really just the, the, the our roading databases are our point of truth for activities that we do on the road. It'll give us the feedback that we need to be able to program good quality forward works programs. And if we have bad data on there, we're not going to have a very good forward works program. So it's, it's looking at how we've made changes, what we're doing to improve. We're looking to try and retain that score, keep that up there by continual investment in, in, in data, capture, analysis, input. Um, the, the new roading maintenance contract looks heavily at how we actually do that as well. Um, just so that we can improve the level of knowledge that we have in our assets. So the decision making that we make is good, robust, sound decision making. Um, so just comparing that with um, our two neighbours. Um, we've got their last year's and this year's schools as well. So we've managed to uh, achieve a reasonably significant uh, result compared to, uh, compared to their neighbours. So now we get to the nitty gritty, uh, looking at our funding request. So this is looking at what we requested versus what the transport agency initially came back with. Um, and you'll see the variations there are all, all in the negative. Um, and we, 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 our initial bid was 14.6 million over, over three years. What was suggested uh, was more appropriate was 12.7, which was not hugely different to what our previous funding had been. Um, and uh, there was about a $1.8 million difference between what we were asking for and what you had certainly, uh, as, as councillors, had, had approved versus what the transport agency had come back with. And now, uh, uh, my learned colleague earlier um, touched on that and that there was some funding constraints related to that. Um, what we was looking at was the implications of this, largely how what we what they would mean to us. Um, looking at the first the first line in terms of sealed pavement maintenance with a reduction of two hundred fifty eight thousand over over three years, potentially it may not be a significant change. The likelihood is that it would be. Um, and the actions that we would need to start taking with lower funding would be 
uh, reviews on levels of service around the network. We would certainly need to have a look at what we do on some of our lesser trafficked, lower volume, uh, lower, lower importance, lower significant roads, um, and how we deal with those. Um, some of the other major uh, cutbacks was the Silk Road resurfacing. Again, that would have made it quite significant and difficult to achieve our um, target um, sealing rates. Um, we have a target rate of um, around about 7% of our network um, with the reduced level of funding. We, we were struggling to get to 7 at the previous funding that we had, um, simply because of rising costs. Uh, with the increase, we're likely we might get there. We might still be a little bit short, but time will tell. Um, it's going to be a bit of a hard one to, uh, to figure that one out at the end of it. Um, footpath renewals is another one where um, it, was, it was cut back. Uh, footpath maintenance uh, again as well. So there was a, a, bit, of a bit of an interesting mix of, uh, of work that had been knocked back. Uh, we certainly have that program of works that's been presented to you already on footpaths. That took into account these figures, not our final figures. Um, just touching back onto that, our final figures actually look a little bit better. We're still down a wee bit in sealed pavement maintenance. That hasn't really changed. Uh, but what we did end up getting wins on was the uh, cycle path maintenance, footpath maintenance, footpath renewals, um, and seal road resurfacing with a significant uh, winners out of that. Um, so the network and asset management activity is a, is a bit of an interesting one. Um, that's where we look at targeting a lot of investigation and development work. Um, we did ask for a reasonable increase in that um, this time around. We didn't quite get it. Uh, we'll have to make the best of what we've got available. There is another activity class that's not actually listed in this group. And funding is only just still in the throes of development for that. Um, and we will look at see to see what we can recover from that loss into the other activity class. It's a, it's a one that was specifically set up for um, funding of uh, investigations. Uh, so Forward Works program. Now I know um, Councillor Martin, thank you. You did uh, put out some uh, a request for some feedback. Um, before the meeting, it was it was quite interesting to read through uh, some fairly common points there. Um, looking in terms of doesn't quite show up very well there, but the top in the list is this current financial year, moving through uh, subsequent financial years out to um, year six. So anything in red is something that we've identified and confirmed we will be resurfacing this year. Uh, Sewell Street is uh, one of those, uh, the top part of Sewell Street at least. The difference in that chart with the line thickness is the um, size of road chip that's um, indicated for the, for the surface treatment. Thin line is small chip, fat line is larger chip. There is some uh, other issues on Sewell Street in particular that we do need to address. Um, there's a, a, an uneven surface at the uh, northern end, which we are working through with the contractor on that to do some uh, pavement repairs. Um, but that's, uh, that's that sort of thing. So this, this has been produced based on the work that we've put into the program business case, um, and that that business case was what the transport agency signed off on. So um, it's uh, reasonably robust, but this, this really gives us an indication of where, where we're looking. Um, we've confirmed most of the, um, the reseals for this year and next year, um, looking at other townships that were uh, uh, Kinneary. 
uh, Ross. And Hast. So there are some other roads, rural roads, but they won't show up as well in the uh, in the slides. Um, so yeah, this this was um, how we've how we've developed our forward works program. It's a, it's a, a map that was produced in our roading um, software. Um, going forward, this is. This is the confirmed list for this year. Um, so we're looking at about 19 kilometres. Uh, the final figure will depend on how much we've got uh, available in budget. We built this based on the original um, funding uh, allocation. Uh, with the revised funding allocation, we'll be able to add uh, one or two other roads in there to uh, increase that level of service. Uh, next year, we have an indicative list that we'll be working towards. Um, the ones in yellow are ones that we've uh, had a bit of a look at already and are reasonably confident that uh, they'll be included in. So what we do with these is the maintenance contractor gets these lists um, and we work through a number of different activities that they carry out, which will be uh, curb and channel repairs, surface repairs, dig out repairs, leveling at un uneven surfaces, uh, shoulder maintenance, uh, which is flanking, um, and a number of other defects that we, we tidy up on the roads that we're, we're working on. And we, we try and get uh, one to two years ahead of um, everything else, ahead of the reseal program, so that some of the repairs might have time to, uh, to settle down. Um, we have any questions on that? Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, um, Carl. Just on the, and it's good to see that um, the uh, Sewell Street work is going to be done. I just, in terms of the, um, um, the, 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 the upgrade work you're going to do, what, um, can you just ex explain that? Like, um, is it going to be dug out? So there is some areas in Sewell Street that we will dig out and, and relay. Yes. And likely we'll need to do some stabilisation on them. Yes. Uh, there are quite a few areas where it's just a levelling overlay that's required. Yeah. Um, so that's just a matter of um, and filling the voids with a bit of uh, plant mix. Um, yeah. So salt and cold uh, bitumen mix that, uh, that we roll in. And it needs, it needs about two to three months before the resurfacing can go on top of that to, to set and the hydrocarbons to evaporate out, but that's generally the, the process that we'll be taking. And that's from the, I'll take it from the town belt down to... So uh, from the town, the, the part that we're rehabilitating at the moment and working on is from the town belt down to, I think it was... Park Street or Hamden Street. Okay. Then. Okay. Yep. Okay. Section. It was the worst. Yep. The worst section coming coming yep. through into town. It's not quite so bad, but there is still some yep. work. That we need to, we need to okay. okay. Thank you for that. Okay. So going on to Ford Works programming for bridges. At this stage, it is still very much a work in progress. Um, we have done a lot of analysis in terms of life cycle analysis on our structures. Um, that didn't take into account a lot of condition data. It purely looked at um, age-related um, replacement. Uh, as a result, there's not a lot that we've got to do on that avenue. From the inspections that we've had done recently, there was, was a number of bridges that we did identify for replacement. We've had uh, four that we've just replaced on Boldhead Road. Um, so we've taken out old timber structures, replaced them with culvert pipes instead, simply because it's a better solution. And we did a similar one on Allen Road. Uh, so a bit of ongoing work we've got uh, going on is Cauldron Creek on the Jackson's River Road. So we were gifted a bridge by the um, Waikakatahi, uh, Wilson Creek Bridge in the uh, Haas Pass. It was a, an older bridge that had been put in temporarily. 
um, but it's uh, quite well suited to the um, to the use as a replacement for Corbett Creek. But we've uh, managed to uplift that from its location. And that's now sitting on site in part at Corbett Creek while we uh, do a bit more design work before the installation goes ahead. Um, in this current round of funding, um, we're looking at uh, Fox Creek um, on the old Christchurch Road. Um, it's been on the on our list uh, to look at for some time. Um, we've, we've had a number of problems, as people will be aware, with the uh, road surface. Um, we're not looking at a replacing that with a bridge. What we are looking at doing is relining culvert pipes that are there and putting in an extra pipe as an overflow for higher flow. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of the history behind Fox Creek culverts, but it was originally a temporary structure uh, put in by a gold miner at the time. Um, for reasons unknown, it was never removed and taken away at the time the gold mining was finished. Uh, 1860, and we, and we don't hear it probably. Um, <laughs> but that, that, that said, we, we just need to do it. So we do have plans in place this financial year to, uh, to do that work. Um, additional to that, uh, going into the low cost, low risk activity class. Now, uh, it was, was mentioned that we did have a significant amount of funding for the special purpose road. Um, so that in itself is a resilience project that we're looking at. Um, we did nearly lose a section of that road to the sea at Okuru not too long ago. Uh, so our aim is to uh, improve on that um, protection works, uh, plus some improvements in the bay uh, road itself leading up to the, uh, the wharf, which is another area of significant risk. Oh, um, Warming. Well, climate change, I should say. Sorry, Carl. Just while you're on the Jackson's Bay Road, what about between Hannah's Clearing and the Arrawatta River? So you're talking about the uneven sections there, which we just had that current section is just sealed at the start of this week. Um, mm -hmm. We've actually got some other areas identified for pavement rehabilitation in this current program going forward as well. We've had, we've had designs uh, pre-done on that. So we've just now got to um, put that out as a, as a body of work uh, to tender. And so what are you gonna do? Geogrid, cement stabilize, and then? Um, it'll be the same as what we've done on the road already. So it's a granular overlay. Um, there's uh, some sections of uh, reinforced uh, ge geogrid in there, and the um, the pavement itself is cement stabilised. So you're not thinking at all about removal of removal of what, sir? Of the corduroy. Um, no, that that simply makes the project unaffordable and uneconomical. Um, we, we have had uh, some detailed design done on that uh, and that's come back recommending the overlay and leave what's in place. Um, sometimes it's better to um, leave it there and, and build over top of it. In this, this case, is uh, one of those situations. Thank you. Thank you. Speed limits. Now, I'll have to uh, give you an update on that, just a, a bit of an apology. The, uh, our speed limit changes have gone on a bit long. Um, we have had some supply issues with that, and that uh, some of the materials that we've been getting are coming out of China, which takes some time. Um, we have had some delays as a result of the, the most recent uh, COVID lockdown as well. There's also reasonable demand for speed signs nationally at the moment because there's a lot of other change, people changing uh, limits. So we've uh, 
just had delivery of signs yesterday to West Road's yard, and they're just working out a program now to um, finish those installations over the next two, four weeks. Um, and they'll be focusing on the Hokitika area to start with and just moving out from there. There's quite a few signs around here that they haven't managed to get out yet. And does no one nationally produce these signs? Well, they, 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 they buying them, they're buying them locally. But a lot of the, a lot of the materials and things like that are, uh, the suppliers use come from, from China. Another, uh, interestingly enough, when, when we ordered the signs, we ordered frame signs. And the suppliers get their frames from China. Why they're not made locally, I don't know, but um, that that caused us to have to rethink what we were going to do because the site, the, the frame supply was going to push it out another another couple of months at least. Um, so we've we've gone for extra signs, but without the frames. So it'll be instead of a single sign being on the top of the post, it'll be two signs sandwiched on the side of the post. Um, it's, it's been quite an, an interesting uh, process um, with all of these, unfortunately. So, good to see them after. But it will be good to see the tail end of it and see all the rest of the signs up. Council Kennedy. Um, uh, Carl, do those signs come as blanks and then the numbers stuck onto them, or do they come from the supplier with the numbers stuck on them? Uh, no, no, they come from the suppliers made up with the um, numbers to, to suit. Oh, no, that's fine. No, just a few of them are a bit wonky, not level okay. numbers. Okay. That's just the Ocarito ones. <laughs> no, there's none in Ocarito. <laughs> okay, so this is the, the, the last topic of conversation uh, for today, and it's really around speed limit changes that are going on, not just for our patch, but there's changes in the way the rules are being written to enable, it, enable us to set speed limits with a bit more ease than what we have in the past. Um, so these are these are some good changes, but uh, just just touching on what the what the proposals are. So we have a just check to see if I had another slide there. We have a number of number of proposed changes. So the proposal one is speed management plans. What that means for us is that our current speed bylaws will become null and void, and speed management will be dealt with through a speed management plan. Now those speed management plans, the intention is that they're a regional speed management plan, and they are written and developed by the individual RCAs, but administered by the road transport committees, which is a combination of transport agency and three TAs on the coast in our instance. So they'll be overarching administration by the road transport committees. But individually, we will develop our own uh, combined speed management plan for the coast. That will also give us an, an, an ability to have some influence on what's going on on the state highway network as well, which is a, is a good thing. So that leads into the alternative process for setting speed limits. So if there's, at the moment with the bylaws, there's a normal cycle, every time the bylaw comes up for renewal every five years, um, we look at changing what we can. Um, we'll really be doing it outside of that cycle because it gets quite uh, costly. Um, but there will be a process to actually do that um, set up under the new rules. So if we have some roads set up and there's, if it aligns with what's in the speed management plan, we'll be able to set a speed limit without going through uh, a larger um, overarching process. Um, so once the, once the speed management plans are, are developed, there'll be a certification process for that. So these, these plans, are the intention is develop, to develop these over the next training so that they're fully in force uh, 
and, and being used by 2020. Um, speed limits will be entered into what's called the speed limit register. Now, our speed limits, I've been working with um, the Waikiki Katahi on that one at the moment, and all of our speed limits as it's been gazetted have been moulded into the new speed limit register. We've been going through a review and checking process to make sure that they're going correctly. That register will then become the, the guide nationally for where, what speeds are, are where. It's a single, single repository, so it won't be managed individually by the RCAs. It's one agency that will manage the whole speed limit register. We will just have feed, uh, feedback into it. Um, You've got the establishment of the Independent Speed Management Committee. That's the um, Road Transport Committee in our instance, which will help provide that guidance um, at, a, at a regional level. Uh, speed limits around schools are proposing to be changed. There's a couple of options out there. There's a variable 40K limit or a permanent 30K limit for urban schools. And for rural schools, um, they're looking at a 60k limit for traffic past the schools. So this is something that we'll need to consider um, going ahead. We've already made, we've established a 30k limit outside St Mary's, just by default, because we've created the 30k zone. But in, in other cases, um, the Cockatoy School, um, Hokitika Primary, and Westland High will have to do some treatment there. Did establish a 30k speed around Kinetic School as part of the limits. Um, so there's some changes that we've we've snuck in there a bit early, um, but that's not a bad thing. The very attractive yellow bollards by Hokitika Primary, attractive, that's for your benefit later, I <laughs> like yellow. Um, they've really slowed the traffic down and they've also diverted a lot of traffic because people coming up to them, I do it all the time, go, actually, I don't need to go past the school and turn off before then. So they, 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 were actually, they were actually installed to slow the traffic, but it's good that they have that effect. The school and the police actually came to us with the concern they had and the parents were reversing out of the park, doing the U-turn in front of the pedestrian crossing, and of course it's illegal. So we, we came up with that as an, alternative, as an idea for an alternative, just to um, see how it would work. And it seems to be quite effective. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's a good thing. Um, proposal seven, temporary and emergency speed limits. So that's re related to speed limits uh, after an emergency event or, or not be a significant uh, emergency event, say the Kaikoura quakes where speed limits have been changed temporarily on the alternative route. Um, there's some, some rules uh, coming in place to, uh, to set that up as a, as a better uh, method of, um, of working. Uh, it's not really going to have much of an, uh, an effect uh, on us. Got, how much longer we go here, Carl? No, I'm just about it's time. I'm just about finished. I can wrap this up pretty quickly. Um, so approval for certain speed limits. So prior to um, the changes, uh, 70 and 90 k limits were taken away from us. Um, they came back by popular demand, they've been returned. So we will be able to exit 70 or 90. Um, that's, that's, that's a great thing. Um, use of variable speed limits, um, just changes around there in terms of the permission to be able to use them without uh, director's uh, approval. Um, speed limit areas, uh, urban traffic areas, just a minor, minor wording change more than anything else. Um, and changes, the other, other proposals like that is just changes in lengths of uh, road that we can set speed limits for. Um, but it's just a, a the rest of the system the side of things. But the, the upside is that there are some more tools coming and we'll have a greater ability for setting speed limits in the future than what we do at the moment. So, um, thank you. Just a few 
Q and I. Um, probably afterwards. Councillors, uh, need to keep this moving. Okay. Any, any other questions? Um, just directly over the general presentation. Well, one thing, um, a couple of things. Cement Road. Right. I don't see that sitting anywhere in there for the next six years. It's not. Okay, so you've driven up cement there, bro. Right? And, and extending, that, extending seal is quite a challenging uh, proposition for funding. Yeah. Um, there's uh, cases that you would need to make around maintenance and health, and we would be very, very hard pressed to actually make a reasonable case for extending. In general, what um, councils are doing, if they need to, if they wish to extend the seal in some areas, to use a more of the user pays, um, and it's funded out of um, rates to start with, without any contribution from the Waikato Katahi. Once it's sealed, there's a contribution for maintaining it, but it's often done as unsubsidised uh, activities. Um, What's our responsibility under the maintenance then of it? Because there is a lot of potholes yep. along cement being washed. Yep. So that's, that's something that we maintain that best. Yeah. Um, and then <coughs> to that as, as we go. Yeah, but I'd be quite keen if you could. Um, the, the previous maintenance contract has been a bit restrictive in terms of because yeah. it's a lump sum payment and there was not any money available in it to do it. Yeah. So there's a bit of a disincentive in that method. The councils are going, going forward, we're changing. We've that. got two uh, reports that I have to keep the pressure on. Okay. So well, I just want to check if we could if I could get an update on what that maintenance program might look like around some more well, so I can, we can take it back, back to we can come back to you. Um, the yeah, other so thing is just a moment no. because of my it's actually given the resolution in terms of being part of consultation for next year's out annual plan around cement leaf road as well. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, the other thing is around um, what you've done here. So the, these maps um, that you've outlined in colours for the next six years, that's just on the road and that's not on the footpaths though, is it? No, the footpaths has been developed separately from that. So that's been presented in the wedding uh, at a previous council meeting. Okay. So there is another program. Okay. okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Councillor Martin, you had a suggested resolution. Thank you, Worship. I just I appreciate we're moving um, quite slowly today and we've got a lot to get through. Um, Sill Street is critical and it needs more than I think just a reseal, Carl. I think there's significant work that's needed to make it up to the standard that the ratepayers on that street expect. So I think there's an there's a element of ensuring that we do it to the best standard rather than just seal it. And um, this is the feedback. Um, Davy Street is a mess. Um, the northern end of Davy Street, um, the approach towards Park Street is, is by far one of the worst surfaces in the town. I think that absolutely needs to be um, highlighted and included in next year's annual plan. Cement Lead Road, there's an ongoing request from the ratepayers and residents up there to ensure that that is captured as part of our ceiling projects going forward. I think it's critical that that's part of an item for consultation in next year's annual plan. We picked up, I don't know if you were there, Carl, when we talked to um, uh, the guy from Waka Kotahi around the letter that council sent many moons ago around the 50k, 80k Hukutika Bridge that He's given an undertaking to follow up on that. So that is, were you there? I'm in the yeah, room I mean, at that time. I, I was there. We, we also kept the pressure on the uh, agency over that as well. Okay, so that's that's an important one, I think, for a lot of people. Um, it's not just about changing speed limits for the sake of it. There's been a lot of requests around that. We've covered the signage stuff. Um, parking, which we've picked up loosely but particularly on railway terrace and hamilton street they're easy wins i think when the painting trucks in town and i think we should be advancing those um into angle parking and that footpath around mitre 10 have we got any update on that 
So the top one that side might intend was put out for pricing uh, just prior to lockdown. Um, I haven't uh, followed up on where that's at. That's uh, being dealt with by a, a colleague at the moment. Um, Hamilton Street parking, we have been looking at uh, options there for angle parking. Um, we might not get it on both sides, but we can certainly accommodate it on one side. Councillor Mark. Thank you. And I'm I'll invite sorry. You to I'll invite you to move the resolution. Well, I'll move that we receive the report and that um, staff be instructed to, and then I've got the list, but it has been well circulated and it should be with Meg. So Meg, have you got, are you able to clarify that you've received that, which was circulated sort of seven or eight days ago in terms of this um, update? Yes, we have, and it's noted as part of the resolution. Does it, net, Your Worship, would you like it read out? I, I think you should read it out, get a second that, and we find out, I'm not trying to pressure you, but we've got a gentleman over there who has to get to plane, and the lady over there who has to, to leave the building as well. So if you could read it out, uh, like, you could uh, keep it moving. Um, following, the present, uh, so following the presentation of the transport manager and the items that have been raised by councillors around the table and the discussion that has taken place, that the report from the transportation manager be received and that staff be instructed to, one, scope and consult with ratepayers on the inclusion of the improvement redevelopment of Sewell Street, Hukatika as part of the annual plan 2022-23. The same wording for Rip Davy Street, Hukatika. The same wording for Cement Lead Road, Hukatika. Right to Wakakotahi requesting the 50k speeds north and south be extended to the existing 80 kilometre sign north and, and the south side of the Hukatika Bridge. Uh, install visible signage. Um, at the Kaneri Koifadurangi corner, indicating 50k speed area and 30k for Camp and St Albans Street, noting that that's been addressed, the signs are coming. Uh, change railway terrace for Kutika to the uh, um, one way entrance with angle parking on both sides. Change Hamilton Street to angle parking on both sides and pave the area outside Mida 10's footpath um, with the recently approved stamped concrete surface as a test for other parts of the CBD. Thanks for your work on that, uh, uh, Councillor Martin, and Carl, thanks for your uh, presentation. It's appreciated. Let's move on to Lily. Um, This is the financial report to August 2021, pages 8 to 20. And Linda Truman is our finance manager, and she'll present the report. Thank you, Your Worship. And good afternoon, Your Worship and councillors. I present the financial report for August this year. And through Your Worship, I'll take it as read. And through Your Worship, I'll accept any questions. Thank you. Councillors, any questions on the um, on the, the financial report, which is which is designed to give an indication of council's financial performance for the first month? Very difficult to, to get uh, very accurate at this time of year. No questions. By the council to move the financial performance report for August two thousand and twenty-one be received. Councillor Hart, Councillor Neil, those in favour? Aye. Hi. The first presentation is easy. Long may that continue. We'll work on that. Thank you, Anisha. Thank you. Now, with your consent, councillors, I'd like to bring forward the three waters matter because Chris has a plane to catch. Um, it's on. Oh, yeah. All right, so it's on pages 39 to 91 of your agenda, and Scott will present. Thanks, Scott. Okay. Thank you. The significance of the government's three waters proposal in Western districts 
are considerable and wide ranging. The council spent a lot of time and effort analyzing the data that exists as it applies to Westland and has endeavored to assess as far as it can the impact of the proposals for the district. The council has engaged with its communities within the district and across the district to obtain views to help inform it in its deliberations. And it's also commissioned independent consultants, Tompkins and Taylor, who have produced the report for today. And Tompkins and Taylor have also other districts across the West Coast and other parts of New Zealand. The impact of the government's three waters reform proposals for Westland goes beyond three waters itself and has implications for future rate levels and wider service provision provided by the council. I'm going to hand over to, to Chris, purchase from Tonkin and Taylor, to take you through the report. Welcome back, Chris. Thank you. Coming a bit of a coaster. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I love it, Mark. One of, one of my teenage sons is thinking about shifting down here for a year to TPP, so Fam family's moving in the whole world. <laughs> Good on him. Huh? Yeah, that's right. So, um, is it reasonable to assume that you've had a, a read through the document? So um, I guess what I, I was intending to do was to um, talk about a few of the key points um, and also to give you some reflections from the work that I've been involved in in other parts of the country. So um, as a result of the work that I'm doing for you and other councils, I've been part of a working group that LGNZ had facilitated um, from this consultants and working group across the country. So that gives us a, gives me a pretty good sense of, of where people are thinking or where councils are headed. In this process, and, and obviously over the last week or two, there's been a lot of media um, activity as well. So you've probably got a pretty good sense if you've been keeping an eye on, on the news stories. Um, so I thought maybe just to start with that, um, that broader context, um, I think pretty consistently what we're seeing across the country is a, um, a number of questions that people are raising about the proposals that have been put forward at the moment. Um, they've been focused on uh, the representative structure, um, so this concept of a representative group um, that's put forward in the proposals, which is quite complex, doesn't really provide a governance structure, but does provide some uh, representative role for local authorities and mother whenua in appointing our competence-based boards for the new entities. So there's been a lot of discussion around how that might work. Um, there's been quite a bit of thinking and, and discussion around how the strategic planning for the delivery of free resources works. So what's the role of these new spatial plans that are coming through in the, the RMA reform? What's the role of the long-term plan? Um, what is the role of things like the uh, investment prioritisation framework that these new entities need to put forward? So there's a number of different things that will actually guide activity for these entities in how those are developed. The level of influence that individual councils have is actually um, becoming clear is going to be very, very important. And actually, to a degree, in terms of delivering outcomes for your community, um, the structure is proposed, those strategic planning documents are probably actually more important than the representative group and that, that kind of governance um, framework that's been set up. Um, so those are probably the key issues that I'm hearing. Um, a lot of councils are providing feedback uh, without prejudice, if you like, so um, making it clear that um, they are providing feedback but they have yet to uh, be fully convinced that there's a case for the particular model that's being put forward. Um, and that's certainly what I'm hearing from around a lot of council tables. So a couple of days ago, um, I was at a Horofanua District Council um, meeting, finalising their feedback, and they worked really hard to get that message clear. We, we're not committed to the... Um, to the reforms, but if you do go ahead, there's some things we think you need to think about with the basic tenor of their, their reply. And you'll see some similar um, sentiments coming out of the work that we put together for you as well. Um, so I guess our key task for the Western District and for the other councils on the coast was to take a look at the proposals as they were presented and say, well, what are the impacts for, for council and for your community? 
Um, and the first thing that's worth um, being really, really clear about is that uh, to a large degree, these reforms are being presented as a series of principles. Um, so in principle, this will happen, or in principle, um, it, that will happen. Um, there's a couple of areas where there's, a, a, there's quite a bit of detail, um, and that's kind of created the illusion that these are quite detailed and completely formed proposals. I think it's pretty clear that they're not. Um, so that places some limitations around the level of analysis that we can do, we've had to make some big assumptions. So I just wanted to make that really clear at, at the start. And to be fair, government has asked for feedback on those principles, and is, um, certainly the signals we're getting at the moment is that they are going away to think about the feedback that they've received from councils already, and that is coming in um, pretty much as we speak. Um, so in terms of our analysis, our role was not to recommend the position, and was really around highlighting issues and opportunities. Um, and give you some ideas around feedback that you can provide to government in terms of changing the proposals. How could you strengthen those proposals to, to maintain or improve your ability to deliver the right outcomes for your community? So then obviously the key question is, if these reforms go ahead, a big chunk of your activities are taken away from council and put into another entity. So what does that look like for um, the council that is left behind, if you like? Um, and Scott's already alluded to the fact that that's going to have a pretty significant impact. Um, so there's issues such as stranded overheads, and the finance team have had a bit of a look at that. Um, that's got a, an immediate impact, um, but government has offered, a, at the moment, um, offered a package that will deal with that over the first couple of years. Um, the problem with that is that that um, those stranded overheads don't necessarily go away after a couple of years unless you materially reduce your costs. So in the medium to long term, um, that's going to have a, a, a proposal where stated would have a, a, an impact on your, your ongoing rates bill um, and would re result in increases beyond what you've anticipated within your long term plan. Um, from a borrowing capacity perspective, um, it doesn't have that much impact based on the, the um, analysis that we've seen so far. Um, but there is a risk um, that you lose some revenue from um, West Roads if they no longer have the opportunity to provide free water services to this new entity in, in the future as well. So the net impact is that you're in, in a worse off position as, as the information is presented at the moment. So as you, you are probably aware, government has offered a uh, support package to help you through the transition process. Um, I think there's, there's room for pushing quite hard um, on exactly the way that that support package is configured um, for your council if the reforms do go ahead. Um, I've already talked a little bit about the representative group. Um, I guess my feeling is that representative group is a better label than, a, than some form of governance structure. As I said, that regional representative group has six representatives at the moment from across Entity D, um, which is over 20 councils. Um, so you may or may not have a, a council representative on it. Um, it also has six representatives from Mana Whenua. Um, so there's probably similar issues there um, from, from a Naihatahu perspective in terms of having the broadest representation, representation that might be desired. The role of that group is to appoint a committee to appoint a competence-based board. So you can see there's several, several degrees of separation between the board that actually exercises governance over delivery um, from um, local government in terms of actually um, setting up that process. So I guess like coming back to my earlier point, um, when I was talking about how people are thinking nationally, um, that, that representative structure doesn't really give you the ability to direct or require the entity to deliver or to get alongside you to deliver outcomes for your community. Um, so that means that the strategic planning framework that's been put forward, and it's, it's, there's not a lot of detail on it at the moment, um, but that strategic framework is going to be absolutely critical to enable you to work alongside whoever is delivering your three water services um, in the future. So as I said, there's the spatial plan that you would develop at a regional level. Um, there's a thing called a letter of expectation that would be de developed by that a regional representative group, but you would anticipate that would have a strong level of input from every council. Um, mana Whenua have the opportunity to put forward a Te Mana Atawai statement. And interestingly, it's become increasingly clear that that will be, that isn't necessarily a single statement at an entity level, that could come from um, a range of EUE, even down to Hapu level or, or, or lower, um, in terms of giving a range of perspectives and the entities have an obligation to have regard to that alongside other things. So that's an interesting model in that there's multiple statements coming in from EUE, but at the moment a single statement expectation from across, well, 
local government, so you can see some rooms for improvement there. Um, and then you'll still have to do long-term plans, and some of the activities that you commit to with your community and your long-term plans will rely on free water services to enable them or to support those activities. So there would need to be some way for those, your long-term planning to integrate with the way that the three waters entities are, are planning to deliver their services. And remember their role is around service delivery, not to drive decision making, but to support and, and be enablers and partners with you. So that's great at a principles level, the big question is how do you actually lock that down um, in practice? Um, so those are the areas that we've um, focused on in terms of suggesting feedback and the document that we've developed for you. Um, and it's consistent with the sort of feedback that I'm seeing coming from a number of local government organisations around the country. Probably enough from me. I'm very happy to answer yeah. questions. So a couple of sentences ago, so you said um, we're still going to make, so we would, for example, still be able to make a decision locally about what our wastewater treatment plant's going to look like, but then the new entity would drive? No, no, so that's, oh, that's no. certainly not the way that it's been expressed at the moment, no. So um, as a community member, effectively you would have a, a sense we're getting at the moment is there would be a, some form of consultation process around investment plans and so on, but that wouldn't be driven explicitly by council. So that would, your broad requirements might be set within the statement of expectation, within the spatial plan, you might say we're going to extend in this area and therefore we're going to need reticulated water or sewage or whatever it might be. But the, the entity will have the role of actually delivering that. And, and it's, as I say, there's, there's quite a bit of complexity in terms of that, that relationship between local authorities responsible for broader community planning and community outcomes and free water services as an enabler or a supporter of that activity. So the, the nuts and bolts, my read, is sits within the strategic planning framework more so than the representative group. So I think that's, that's probably quite important to understand. So in relation to a, a project like that, do, do you think that this proposal simplifies or complicates the process for, for, our, for a council like ours? I don't know that we've got enough detail to be able to answer that clearly, to be honest. Um, I think in, in the short term, if it's in your annual plan, you would expect that it would be grandparented into the programme for the, for the entities. Um, but that's a, that's a transitional thing. Um, I think, um, I mean, something like specific three waters assets or investment for growth, um, et cetera, um, would be driven by the new entities is, is the way that I am reading the proposal. Um, but if those, if that investment is required to support broader growth activity that you're committed to within your spatial plan or through your long-term planning process, then it becomes a matter of collaborating with that entity to figure out how to make that happen. And I think where the challenges lie is where you want to grow, where you've got growth occurring and you need to service that in other areas too as well. So another key piece of work that these new entities will need to develop as a thing called an investment prioritisation framework. So trying to figure out really how you prioritise investment. So given that uncertainty, is it possible for Council of Bowers to do any kind of financial analysis of the benefits or the disadvantages? Because I'm not certain of how the, you know, how the, the problem lies as it were falls on this. Is, is, there a, is it a financial advantage or a financial disadvantage? We understand the wider principles at stake here, and they're, they're, they're quite important and compelling, but when it comes down to the dollars and cents, do you know how that impacts on council like ours, or our council? So there's probably two ways to answer that. So I guess one, one aspect is that, as I said, we've got a, a relatively high level proposal, so we need to make some big assumptions around assessing the financial impacts. What we do know from what we've seen at the moment um, is that by removing three waters activities from council, that has a that will have a negative impact because you your some of your overheads are shared across multiple activities, so you end up with effectively stranded overheads. Um, and, um, that um, th those activities, um, some of the, the roles within council that are effectively funded in part by multiple activities will have less funding available. To them. I think we have some millions of dollars of income that come from water. Yes, ab absolutely. It would never then be directed or deflected away from us. That, that's correct. So some, some of that income goes directly to funding water services. So if that goes away, that's fine. But some of that income goes to funding water council activities, running this building, 
um, your reception, et cetera, et cetera. So it's those stranded overheads that are problematic. So I think that, that is a significant issue. The other part of the picture is the, the, the cost of actually delivering those three water services. And there's been a lot of debate around the analysis that um, the Department for Internal Affairs have released, um, completed by WICS, um, Water Industry Commission of Scotland. Um, and I think those numbers, I think everyone's agreed, are not right, um, because it's a model um, numbers um, will never be perfect. Um, but the, the, um, the way I've heard it described is the direction of travel. Um, so, as, so the sense is if you've got bigger scale of delivering complex projects, you've probably got to be able to do that more efficiently. So I think that, that part of the puzzle, um, I think it's pretty hard to argue with the fact that those services can be delivered more, more efficiently. I think there's an effectiveness piece around that that needs to be considered. So I think last time we talked, we discussed a little bit around emergency response, for example, and making sure that whatever that, however that entity is structured, it still has local capability to, deliver, to respond to local issues, those sorts of things. So those components, um, again, still, still not enough detail to be able to evaluate them. That makes it really difficult, doesn't it, for councils like us and I to do? Well, well, I think the important thing to remember at this point is government has put out a relatively high level um, proposal and asked for feedback. Right. Um, so they're not actually asking you to say, do you support this or do you not? Right. They're saying, here's our idea, what do you think about it? Council Davidson. Um, yeah, there's, uh, <laughs> it's very complex. There's, there's greater minds than mine that uh, have opted out from this government proposal. And, uh, you know, I've, I've got no no option but just to to uh, go along with that, to opt out of it at this, at this point. And um, I'd just like to uh, congratulate the, uh, the mayor for the encouragement of this uh, notice and motion. Thank you. Sorry, Teresa, I'm not going to say the same as Tinker there. Um, I, I, it concerns me that there have been some, I suspect, um, misinformation around it, and it's become a real political issue. And I think it's really important. The last thing we said, Chris, was that at this point, we're not. We don't have to decide to opt it or out. We can say, these are our concerns. How are you going to sort them? But I think that's what we should be doing. So certainly, I don't think we've got nearly enough. I don't think we're nearly far enough along the track to make a decision on opting in or out. Just um, respect, Chris, that's, that's actually not correct. The cabinet minute says that uh, we have to indicate our position before the end of September, in which case government will then answer the questions and, and information and will make its decision. And it also says that if we do not opt out, we are automatically opted in. So that's the correct position. The cabinet minutes are there, been circulated, all seen them, pretty straightforward. Question is, are we in or are we out? So, yeah, all three wishes. So, were we discussing the report from Tonkin Taylor um, and Scott, or are we talking about the uh, notice of motion? Uh, we're, we're, uh, with the report. Yeah, it's just a council that was talking yeah. about the motion. So, it's separate. Yes, yes. thank you. Uh, we're just, just so we can uh, release uh, Chris. Um, sorry, Jane, anything, anything else? Um, so previously, I think it was your report, we had identified quite a bit of underinvestment in the three waters there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So does that push us more to the wanting to opt in so that we can ensure that that gets funded? Well, I think there's, there's a couple of issues with the, with, I guess, the, the forward projections in terms of what needs to be spent. Um, I mean, if you look across the country, then historically there's been underinvestment. And, um, but also with the, the other parts of the reforms are around increasing standards or increasing consistency across the country. And the upshot of that is, is that um, across the board, investment will need to increase. So, um, yeah, regardless of, of whether you opt in or opt out, 
um, there's more money to be invested. So that's, that's the challenge. Thank you. Council Mark. <laughs> Um, Scott, and thank you, team, for the report. Um, it's really comprehensive and it provides a, a clear framework for this council to be making the decisions that it considers necessary at this time. I think um, I think also what's there's there's a lot I want to talk about, but um, I just want to seek clarity. Are we talking specifically now for asking questions? Chris of the um, of his report and of Scott for his covering report, Your Worship. Yes, it is. It's focused okay. in that area. Yeah, I guess in a, in a um, we've had been quite a fortunate to be able to have quite a lot of correspondence, and so my questions that I had have been have been answered. Um, and I think the next part of what I want to say will fall out of the notice of motion. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Councillor Hatchell. Yeah, yes, I'm uh, the same, Your Worship. Um, there's been a lot of questions and a lot of answers, and uh, we'll just wait for the notice of motion. Thank you. Francois. I'm all good. Thanks, Chris. Councillor Kennedy. Um, yeah, sorry, just one question. So you mentioned. Uh, about West Roads and the revenue derived from that. Um, so if we didn't have West Roads, would we be financially better off to opt in? Is that, no? No, so the, the point I'm making there is that they, uh, um, they, they deliver three water services um, for council. Oh. And, um, and in a future state where you have a large organisation, that opportunity might not be presented to them. And in doing those three water services, the, um, some of the cost is returned to you as a dividend. So there's an issue there around capital financials, but I guess in a broader sense, there's also an issue around making sure that there are opportunities for, um, for local businesses, local contractors to, to participate in, in delivering services. And that's potentially at risk with a much, much larger organisation. So, oh, no. like, sorry. Oh, so no, that's fine. No, I just wondered whether it pushed you, pushed us over the threshold. Um, the next question is, because you've mentioned you've uh, worked with quite a few councils in regard to this, and have any of the councils that you work with been financially better off or um, to opt in? No, I, th I think um, all of them are concerned about the stranded overhead component. I mean, that's that's particularly acute for a smaller council like Westland. But um, yeah, I think there's, um, every council has significant questions um, and, and in a lot of cases, the information is just not available. Yeah. Councillor Hart. Uh, I don't have any further questions because we've had a lot of information on this, but I'd just like to thank the team for the amount of work that's, that we've done around this three orders and um, in Chris's report, it's very comprehensive um, with his expertise. So, yeah, there's a lot of information out there, so it's been great. Yeah, thank you very much for the work you've actually put into this. And, you know, I mean, it's not just our council that you're actually getting the feedback from. It's everywhere, so um, that gives us some real comfort. Um, just out of curiosity, because I know there's, there's something like 67 councils around New Zealand. Yeah. Of the 67 councils at the moment, do you have any indication of how many of them are uh, opting out? Um, I don't know. Um, you may have a, have a better handle on those numbers. You know, it's a significant proportion. Oh. I think, think what's been really interesting is people have tried to understand the proposal. Um, uh, certainly the discussion around the, the table with the LGNZ technical group has been along the lines of people are just open-minded trying to understand to becoming increasingly sceptical because of the lack of detail as much as anything. Um, so I think it's certainly moved from being a, a few who are um, concerned to a number who have expressed concern as what I was observing in the media. Oh, any questions on the, the staff report? Um, yes, thank you. So, so to be honest, I, I was expecting um, a little bit more detail on this report. 
I thought that we were going to have from the Tonkin Taylor report um, the breakdown and simple comparisons of this is how much it's costing you now, this is how much it's going to cost you later, um, and what the forward work program is, and, and then that carried through. Um, but there's none of that. And I notice on page 71 that you say there's been some significant efficiency claims based on the DIA model. And a breakdown, a breakdown on these will be achieved outside general. Um, on, on, no, sorry, a breakdown on how these will be achieved uh, outside general statements is yet to be confirmed. So here they go again. Um, that aside, the um, uh, there are a couple of, well, there's lots of things that are concerning about, about it, but um, one was uh, West Roads, um, that it uh, potentially affects the viability of, of West Roads because it's a significant strand of their work. Um, so that's one. Another one was uh, where you, um, uh, you say that middle management positions basically will go from here to Christchurch. I mean, they're, they're hardly going to be based on the, on the West Coast anymore in Westland. It's a good buy to them. Um, and the, um, the, the model, although there were, there's still lots of gaps in the information, to be honest, um, the, the model, as far as I can see, takes no cognizance of the, the 300 kilometers between here and past. How do they, how do they reconcile that? They can't, and, and the new entity, whichever entity it is, is going to have to factor that in to their costs, which can only go one way, it, and that ain't south. So. I think the appropriate thing to hear to do is release uh, Chris. Um, thank you so much for. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was going to stay here and talk to it and release listen, listen in on the, uh, the waste management oh. paper. I've got some interest in as well. But yeah, okay. Happy, happy to be here to answer uh, questions. Have a go for the time. It's unlikely that we'll get here. Oh, okay. 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 Well, we stay as long as you like and, yep. uh, and don't miss your plan. <laughs> That's right. Well, thanks for the opportunity to come and talk to it again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So let's move, let's move on to the... Okay. Okay, so it's all like to move that we receive the report from uh, from uh, Taylor and um, Scott. Councillor Neil, have a second. Yep. Those in favour? Aye. Let's now open it to discuss the other issues, the issues that affect this council, our community, the feedback we've had from our community, um, and let's talk about that. So, uh, Council Davidson, should we kick off with you? Yeah, well, I've already uh, yeah. spoke my piece on that, uh, Your Worship, and uh, and I, I'm sticking to that. Yeah. Okay. Council Neil. Um, yeah, I'll have more clarification around what you said before. Thank you for that. So, if we opt out, we can still opt in. feedback to the government. Well, we can change your mind. And well. they can change what they're saying and then we can opt in. That's correct. But if we opt in now, that's it. Is that what you're saying? Uh, we're, we're stuck with the option. We're staying opted in the whole the, time. The, the, the situation is we have to we have to indicate to the government uh, the questions and what our position is. And if we don't indicate that we've opted out, then we are deemed to be opted in. At that point, government will come back to us at some stage and uh, provide whatever. Uh, you know, at this stage, there's so much misinformation out there, it's really hard to tell what, what's going to happen. So I'm probably not the right. You know. No, I mean, I've got lots of questions both ways, so I'm not convinced to be the one. Yeah, <laughs> 
as in your water sa in doors that I want the opportunity to go and take it with the government but if I could just comment on that, the problem seems to me that the government's put us, the council, in an invidious position. have been forced to make important decisions, but the detail's not there, the framework's not there, mm. and so it's very hard for us to make um, the sort of decisions we would like to make because we just simply don't have the sort of analysis that you talked about. And, and I asked the question too: was uh, we, we don't have we don't have figures. Um, so we, we, we've then got a debate on the, the wider and broader and more general, almost philosophical issues mm -hmm. about control and, you know, those, those mm -hmm. sorts of issues. And um, so my position, I think, is that I don't see how we can um, opt in on any basis until we're fully and properly informed on, on those sort of mm. issues. And therefore, I think we probably have to um, take the cautious approach, opt out, mm. but be prepared to be remain, but to be convinced mm. otherwise mm. in the future if the government can, 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 can do that. Mm. But I think at this stage, we, we, it's very hard to see <coughs> why we would opt in to fix a problem that doesn't exist here. Mm. And uh, Personally, I can't see the advantages of, of this at all for us. There may be some, but it's a bit hard to see what they are sitting here. And, and, and the government has got to convince us that we should be part of this, and I don't think they've really, really done that. Tom, I can see the advantages. Mm -hmm. I think I can see some advantages to it, but I, I, I agree, yeah. So probably I'd be opt out, but keeping that door open. Council Kindi. I'm sorry, so uh, just to clarify, are we discussing the notice of motion or? Yes, we are. Um, oh, honestly, I'm really keen to hear what Councillor Martin's um, got to say in terms of the notice of motion. Let him fire away first, if that's all right. Councillor Martin. Are you really sure you want me to fire away, Councillor Kennedy? <laughs> um, so like all of you I think we started this process with a really open mind and we had our ears to the government and we had our ears to our residents and our ratepayers and we're considering views and as a result of that we undertook a community engagement process that to be fair was um, really well um, supported with quite a lot of um, uh, feedback from our community generated and that was seeking the views of um, how people were feeling in regards to the information that was had at the time. And a lot of really genuine and serious issues and questions were raised um, on both sides of the debate and uh, in terms of opting in or opting out. I think it's really important to um, note that it's really critical that we take our community with us on this journey and that we act in the best interest of our community and also um, do as they want us to do as their elected representatives. So often there's decisions that council make that are inconsequential to um, the average person that we talk to on the street and their eyes glaze over when we go to the detail of things that we consider. But this is an issue that has really captivated a lot of people in our district and um, in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and it's very, very strong, clear opinions that are coming through. So with that in mind, I think during the consultation process, we've seen a lot of um, our residents and ratepayers respond. Um, an overwhelming 92% of them indicated that they would prefer council to opt out of the proposed reforms. And considerable feedback was around uh, removal of democratic control of these assets, so how they were perceived, um, how how residents perceive that at the moment council has a direct control by residents electing um, representatives to um, uh, govern these assets and 
in the interest of themselves as ratepayers and that they feel that that uh, could potentially be removed under the new model and the removal of control over um, setting or establishing fees and charges associated with water, the treatment of water, whether or not water is fluoridated, whether or not it's treated a certain way, will be um, it's perceived that those um, things will be removed from, from us as a council and placed in a wider network. There's, um, it's fair to say there's considerable questions that people have around um, centralizing versus localizing assets and control. And um, if you actually look at what makes a community and place-based um, kind of solutions to issues, um, localism and um, people on the ground having connection to things um, results, I believe, in a better outcome. So there was a lot of feedback around that in terms of the, the removal of control, but also the removal of responsibility and, and caring and ownership over water and, and what happens to water. And it's fair to say that our community does care about those matters, as seen with the wastewater treatment plant proposal. The community wants to be involved. They want to be able to gov uh, support um, uh, the council and uh, to, to make the decisions that are the best interests of them. And when I consider the decision to um, switch from a, a ocean outfall uh, to a um, land-based uh, treatment for the Hukatika system, that decision was able to be made quite quickly and respond to our ratepayers um, quite timely, whereas it wasn't tied up in a whole tier of um, a process that required someone outside of our region or district to tell us what's best for us. Um, there's, um, so talking to my notice of motion now specifically, um, I would like that um, the council receives um, the reports that were just tabled and that the council acknowledges that the community engagement results and survey responses councils undertaken provide an opportunity for council to survey its community and that these resulted in some of the largest levels of community feedback in council's history. A total of 370 responses have been received and of those were of and of those 92% of respondents indicated they want council to opt out of the proposed reforms. I think it's critical that um, any feedback that we put through is provided to the Minister for Local Government and a copy is sent to LGNZ and the Department of Internal Affairs. And I think this is an issue that should be um, written um, collectively, signed by uh, His Worship the Mayor and by each councillor on our council, whatever the decision, uh, whatever decision is made today. I think it's um, also important to note that we oppose establishing four large water entities as the answer and, uh, in the proposal because we believe that they will remove uh, free water assets and services from local councils. I think to date, I'm not convinced that this proposal provides the best governance and financial outcomes for the district. And as a result, I'm um, seeking council support um, based on the information available at present to opt out of the reform should this decision be required. I think this position is backed by our community and is reflected in the feedback collected during the community engagement that's been undertaken. That's the, um, that was the notice of motion as was put. As a result of um, significant shifts that have happened since that notice of motion was placed um, through the process, there's been quite a lot of additional information that's come to the fore and a lot of other councils that have taken positions. And one of those is around um, the relationship between local government and central government and the, and the kind of the position that central government may or may, not, may, or may not take in terms of actually um, directing or legislating for councils to uh, be part of these reforms. And I think it's critical that we um, stand up for our community and the wants of our community and that we strongly and actively oppose any directive to mandate um, a structure on Westland and on the currently proposed entity-based model for the um, services of three waters. So I'm seeking support from the council that we 
um, actively oppose any um, moves for the government to legislate and direct um, uh, that we become part of the, the large four um, model. I think it's really important that we um, also note that all of this, what's led to this notice of motion has come from a background of matters and a lot of reports that we've able to been able to commission ourselves in partnership with neighbouring councils, but also reports that have been available from local government New Zealand, DIA, central government cabinet minutes that have been re proactively released or released. And all of that has resulted in us, I think, um, and what I'm advocating for is for us to oppose the um, four large water entities because they remove the three water assets from our council, that we have significant concerns about the um, current government proposal and don't believe that um, that it does, um, that it can, these, these concerns cannot be mitigated within the constraints of the current proposed proposal as structured and presented, and that it actually requires a wider conversation without being confined to the um, structure as put by the government. <laughs> this is based on the background of uh, a potential loss of local decision-making, which is um, a major issue for our community. And we don't believe we can just achieve the um, necessarily necessary outputs just by fine tuning or tweaking the proposal as put by the government. And that um, under this um, proposed model, the council will actually lose all the benefits of the ownership of those assets. And that's been presented by our staff in terms of stranded overheads and a lot of technical detail that wasn't well communicated at the start of these reform package, which has come to light. The accelerated time frame, the true lack of consultation and the real lack of any alternatives have resulted in us kind of being in this awkward, flawed process. There's also some big reform packages that are happening at the moment within um, central government. And one of them is the major reform of local government. And as part of that, we need to be considering the role of local government in relation to Three Waters as well. And by having those conversations disconnected from each other, I believe it's going to lead to a suboptimal outcome. Um, based on the information presented to date, the financial case in support of the proposal does not reflect the uh, actual situation in New Zealand, appreciating that the model's based off the Scotland model, which is a very different context to New Zealand. And the supporting information that we've been presented with, I believe, greatly exaggerates the efficiency gains that are expected um, given the advances that um, we've already made as a district and the condition of our assets and infrastructure. The case for lowering these borrowing costs under the new entity is really questionable. It relies on significant government backing, including the uh, um, trans transfer or removal of debt. And the fact that the proposal may lead to an increased average borrowing costs actually when both the councils and the water entities debts are considered in relation to each other and how that's funded. We've just had NZTA talking about their funding constraints. I mean, this is that's the similar conversation we could be having with a water entity in the future. Um, I believe, based on the feedback we've received, that the proposal will have a detrimental effect to the well-being of the Western community, particularly um, the infrastructure and growth enablers that um, that and that allow for economic development within our region. And the critical aspect of them is um, top quality um, provision of three waters infrastructure. I think earlier. Um, uh, Last month, the mayor, um, with a number of local mayors, requested as um, a pause on the three waters reform, as well as the fact, uh, combined with the fact that we were in COVID nineteen lockdown, and I think we need to put our support behind that again, and have a wider conversation. The fact that we um, that I'm pursuing this doesn't necessarily mean I'm unaware of the fact that there are significant challenges for the three water sector across Aotearoa and New Zealand. And a number of those challenges um, mean that the status quo in their communities cannot be ma maintained because there's, there's things that are happening that are not right for certain communities, particularly large urban communities where there's significant infrastructure required to um, bring the assets about to be uh, usable for the future. 
but all of those considerations need to be um, um, viewed at alongside the conversations around the future of local government and the um, Resource Management Act reform, which is uh, critical pieces of legislation that are all connected to this um, to this conversation. Um, to Mata Arawai, the water regulator um, is is a, I think a necessary step in the right direction, and it's about ensuring there's a consistent standard of um, safety and regulation in the space of water. And I think that's something that um, should be allowed to be embedded in the system and be able to um, demonstrate its value before any major reform is undertaken. The, I think it's important that council note that the options considered, um, and I've kind of labored this point already, but really need to be considered alongside local government reform, engagement with the sector widely, um, and I think that that has to be considerably improved. What's happened is local government New Zealand has signed a heads of agreement with the New Zealand government that um, has, has led us into this um, conversation in a way that they've partnered together and put those options on the table in the hope that the sector comes in behind those. And I think that what that's shown is actually that support isn't necessarily there for the proposed model. So I think it's really critical that we ensure that the sector understands that the model being proposed um, is not supported widely um, as demonstrated by recent media articles and other council minutes that have been coming out. Um, I'm just, um, I appreciate I've talked to this quite a bit, but it's, it's really important that um, I think to that end, we go back and advise local government New Zealand that we do not support the provisions of the heads of agreement. And we advocate and ask local New government New Zealand to consider rescinding that agreement to better reflect the views of its diverse membership. And for some members, that heads of agreement and the model may make sense. But for our council, I don't believe it does. And I don't believe the, um, the model as proposed is the right answer. I really think and um, um, hope councils will support the undertaking that whatever decisions made today is communicated to the minister and with all of our council reports and a council submission and the council resolution to um, the relevant members of parliament, local government New Zealand, DIA and any other councils that are in a similar situation to ours or may find our information and decisions relevant. That part of um, the resolution is about what we do. Then I think it's critical that our chief executive report back to us at a future date um, when more information, if it is available um, from the government, Minister of Local Government, Department of Eternal Affairs, DIA, LGNZ um, has been received and analysed. So we can consider again at that point the decision of council, is it still the correct decision or do we need to alter that decision based on the new information that's presented as a, as a result of this um, consultation process and the decision to opt in or opt out. I hope that um, that Kōrero has clearly um, explained my rationale reasoning and the wording within my notice of motion and I now um, put it forward to as a I'm now moved that that be considered. Um, are you moving that as a resolution or can we just um, can just hold it there? Uh, Councillor Kennedy, you opened the floodgates then. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to ask, but <laughs> uh, no, that's good. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a little bit lost words. I, I, look, there are some questions about it and then in terms of the financial stuff and the numbers um there's been some questions asked about that i don't think anyone really knows um we've got a situation where there's a new uh water regulator that's gonna be here and there's gonna be standards which well we don't even know what the standards are going to be so how can we then price up what we're doing um i think councillor martin's motion um does leave the door ajar slightly if there is new information come to light 
that we should reconsider. Um, yeah, look, I, I I would support Councillor Martin's motion, uh, and I'll move on to the next person. Thanks, uh, Francois. <laughs> Yeah, um, thanks for that, Latham. That was really comprehensive. Um, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty relaxed, and the reason I say that is because, um, you know, if, if they have a brain, if they have a massive brain wave up in that that place in Wellington at some point in time, we can always opt back in. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. And 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 the stuff you highlighted, Latham, was great. Thank you. So, cheers. Yeah, thanks, Latham. Um, to, in in uh, layman's terms, to me, it's a financial decision, and you can't make a financial de decision when you haven't got the answers, and government hasn't come with the answers to the questions. So, um, and being an elected member, you've only got to look at the feedback we got, and um, it's all right for us to sit around the table, but uh, we've got to listen to all those members, that, all those ratepayers that have put their feedback in. And uh, so for me, uh, uh, it's an opt out, but leave the door open so um, we can, you know, if they come back with some great answers, we can get back in. So I'll go with Latham's notice of motion. Councillor Hart. Thanks, Councillor Martin. Oh, I fully support his notice of motion. Councillor Cogan? Um, yeah. I'm not going to be as lengthy as that one. Um, <laughs> but basically, for me, I was I'm just really disappointed in the lack of information on such a large and significant proposal and the potential impact um, that it's going to have on councils around New Zealand. Um, for them to even put us in a position where they were trying to push this through with urgency um, has put um, unnecessary, tremendous pressure on councils and communities um, to get their head around the wider impact anyhow of this, of what's going on and the lack of information they've provided. I, I think from a community perspective, and we're here to be guided by our communities, like Council Mason, um, Lady Martin said, I mean, submissions alone have spoken for themselves from the community, with 92% coming back wishing to opt out. That's pretty convincing to me. Um, and the other big problem I have with this is our council you know, I can only stay focused on our council rather than, I don't know what others around New Zealand have done or have, but our council have done a considerable amount of work and committed a tremendous amount of money into our three waters um, in Westland. Um, why do we want to fix something that's not broken? If other councils around New Zealand are under-resourced and funded to provide quality three waters, then let government work with them independently rather than them pull everyone in under the same overarching umbrella to resolve this issue that clearly is not a nationwide issue. Um, so, yeah, I fully support um, Latham's motion of opting out of this whole process and unless government, I'm afraid, can come back with something better to quantify our reasons to change that, I see no, I don't even see a future advantage in us being able to waste our time going into um, discussions like this when we're given very little to go by. Um, that's my piece there. The only other thing that I do wish to add to this, though, um, which is probably a little bit more, it's to do with in-house, actually, around this whole, with the submission process. Do I need to bring that up now, or are we just going with the motion at the moment? No, just do it with the motion. Sure. Okay, so, yeah, I fully support the motion. And Paul. Yeah, so, um, but look, it, this has been a PR disaster for the government, despite the fact that they brought in a whole army of spin doctors to try to ram it down everyone's throat. 
um, it's backfired. Um, and this has been a signature program of this self-proclaimed transformational government. Um, and it hasn't worked. And the reason it hasn't worked is because the, the problem is there isn't a problem. Basically, I mean, um, look, obviously, Havelock North situation had to be addressed. No question about that. But I think what happened is someone in Wellington has had far too many lattes has decided that, that um, well, why don't we extend that over the whole country? You know, it just doesn't fit. So, um, and so we end up in this, this pickle where we have to, um, councils are having, you know, having to um, uh, make, a, uh, make a stand against the government. And I have no doubt that the government, I've said it before, the government has in their back pocket the, the legislation, that they will legislate and force councils into it. But um, that will be the, um, the suicide note when they do that, I might add. They need to take the lesson from the Labour government of the 1980s when they transformation, the transformational government of, government of the day that got rid of all the government departments and the railways and the post office and the rest of it, and they got turfed out at the very next election spectacularly. And um, I think this will backfire as well. But um, I, so I really think the government need, will be trying to weigh this up, but they've spent so much money in trying to um, push this onto the, onto the population that uh, I, that I find it hard to believe that they won't uh, go the extra distance now to see it through. Um, however, um, that we need to cross that bridge when we, when we come to it. The um, um, noting, of course, that the um, our neighbour neighbouring council made a decision last night, unanimous, to opt out, um, and um, and all all of those other councils around the around the country and the 400 submissions that we've had can't all be wrong, that, um, that they've, they see so much wrong with this. Um, and um, yeah, basically I, I, I think the government has misread the tea leaves on this one. And I think they are, will regret it if they, um, if they force it through legislation on councils. But um, as, a, as a council, I think the best thing we can do is to opt out. Um, David, what do you have to say? But I think that the context of this whole debate is really interesting um, because as you're aware, there's a panel going around uh, here in the submission to talk to councils about the future of local government. We had a session with them um, a month or so ago. That they got our feedback on the issue of local government and the future of it. So, the background in all of this discussion, which is probably coincidental, I think, but it's, it is significant, is what is the future of local government? And the um, government is presently considering that. And um, and then you have this proposal to kind of cut local councils off the knees by taking away one of our most significant functions. Um, you then ask yourself the question, well, what remains local councils to do? And um, <clears throat> does it then make it easier to take the, the rest of those functions away um, uh, as well at some later date? And it probably does make it easier because we, be, we, we become less viable uh, mm -hmm. and, and when our core functions are removed from us um, and you then think, well, is it that much more difficult for the transport agency to then become involved in dealing with our roads and taking that off as well? Mm -hmm. And uh, are we not duplicating things there? And so you could easily run an argument that's, well, who needs local governments mm -hmm. uh, anyway? Mm -hmm. And um, so I think at, at that higher philosophical level, um, I'm um, worried about this because I think there's a certain direction um, here. And so we need to be thinking about this issue, you know, is, is this 
the we see local government something that may, needs to be local and stay local, um, or do we want to see it sort of um, frittering, frittering away? Uh, I worry, as Paul has just uh, indicated, that government um, is committed to this. If it backs down, it'll, it, it paints it into the corner and painted itself with over the uh, housing. Uh, building more houses and starting to own property, uh, um, that um, yes. program is. And, and, and so, so I, I, I suspect they're not minded to back down because they probably can't afford to politically. So um, that, that's a worry. But I to my mind, you've got the, the, the big picture here, which is decidedly worrying. And then you've got the small rats and mice and money issues, which we, we, did, we simply don't know the answers to. And so when you sort of combine those together, it's just hard to see how at the state we can do anything else other than mm. the system. Yeah. Mm. Well, councillors, we have a um, we have a res re uh, resolution from uh, Latham there, and, and Meg's picked up uh, all of those other points as well, uh, Latham, so that it becomes part of the resolution. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to second it. I would love to have moved it. Uh, I, I, I listen around the table. I listen. To, I listen to the feedback. You know, and, and localism is is just so important. You know, we have two choices. One is we have a we have a country that lives that central where power is centralised in Wellington, or we have a country where the the uh, the communities are the most important part. And I've, uh, I don't know about your emails, but mine's still going today, but I don't know where all those things are coming from. They just keep on coming. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'm happy to uh, to second the motion and I ask uh, councillors to, to vote all those in favour, please. All right. And those against, the resolution is uh, uh, unanimous. And Latham, I, I have to congratulate you on the effort you've put into this, um, quite outstanding. And, and your presentation there, um, you know, it, was, it was quite outstanding, absolutely outstanding. Well, we'll move on. Next item on the agenda, I'm sorry. Would, would someone like to, Jenny, yes, Jenny, would move that. And do I have a second that? This is to move to extend for another two hour period. Well done, Jenny. <laughs> Can I just... Two hours, <laughs> seven o'clock. No, we've, we've, passed, we've passed the two hour mark. Yeah. Can you see that? Thank you very much. Well, those in favor? Okay, thanks. Right. I've sent you a text, Bruce. I've got to go. Sorry, I've got to meet so, Pip at five o'clock. Okay, oh, sorry, guys. No, no, no. Look, thank you for saying, uh, Francois. Some of, some of today's uh, stuff was a bit. Um, Boring, some of it was pretty exciting. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, what's the next one? Oh, yes. Can okay, I just quickly raise that in as a shoot with the submission? Is, is, is it something? Okay. That something needs to be covered in the meeting, or can we discuss oh, yeah, three no, separately? We'll discuss. Yeah. Thank you. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. 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 These are the two. So we're up to uh, Wisdom Holdings Limited Director Appointment Extension, pages twenty-one to twenty-three. I will take the report of Western Holdings Limited Director Appointment Extension as being read and happy to take any questions. Uh, any councillors have a question? I'll be going around the table. Is it? Is it? Does anyone wish to? Uh, Councillor Martin. Uh, thanks, Your Worship, I, and thanks, um, Leslie, for the report. It's very straightforward. I have um, I go along and support the recommendation. Just have a couple of questions. It's a perfect system, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Councillor Martin. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll,
done it before. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I'm here. Can oh. I think you just dropped out quickly? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, <laughs> right. Let me start again. I'll turn. I don't know if it's the um if it's the internet bandwidth or what it is. Did you? How much of that did you hear? Uh, nothing. <laughs> oh, nothing. Oh, that, that's probably good. There's probably a bug in the system that every time I talk, it automatically mutes. No. Um, <laughs> no. Hey, if I was. Yeah, no. I was just saying that I go along and support the resolution. My only question is around rotation, the timing of rotation, just ensuring that not every director retires at the same time in the future. I think that's something we were really cognizant of ensuring in the subsidiaries. And just ensuring there's a staged approach to um, director um, retirement, replacement, retention in the future. So not everyone falls due at the same anniversary. That's my first question. Have you have we got any thoughts on how we would deal with that? Yeah, I know this. Uh, sorry, Western Holdings directors have been looking at that, so it is on their radar. Just, just to clarify, I am talking about Western Holdings, as in the three we're about to appoint today, ensuring that in three years' time they're not up for renewal all at the same time. Yeah, but they haven't got a pro they haven't got anything in place now that neither have we at this time. Um, but I believe that it's something they're working on for the next round of um, of appointments. Okay, cool. Thank you. So that'd be good. That'd be a good action to see if all out of this. And the other part is, I think um, it's really important, and I kind of stress it all the time about growing local talent. And I think there's an opportunity here with a really stable board of Western Holdings to be bringing on a aspiring director or a, a sort of an intern director or an additional West Coast based director onto holdings um, within the next twelve months because they have, and as identified in the report, achieved um, outcomes and milestones. And it would be, I think, really useful to have someone sitting on that table as well, learning from those directors. Thanks for that, um, Councillor Martin. I, I, can, I can tell you that they, they are looking at uh, a local appointment to West Roads and a local appointment to Holdings, as far as I'm aware. They're, they're going through a process, but that will come back to council when they've reached a, a decision so that we can make a decision. I believe that's, I believe that's correct, Lucy. Uh, they are looking at the, the West Roads, wasn't, I wasn't aware of the Holdings one. Uh, we, we, okay. I, I'm, I mean, I don't think we have to necessarily make a decision on today. I'm just sort of flagging strategic direction that I think it's really awesome that we uh, um, that we've got willing directors wanting to serve on these boards, and it would be great to continue growing West Coast talent. So, if we have an opportunity in the next twelve months to be looking at an internship or a um, an opportunity for growth for a West Coast director, Holdings would be a, a, a board to put them on. I think it's an excellent idea. Um, are there any other questions? Just one. Um, I, I see, Leslie, the, uh, these um, three appointments expired four months ago. Yes. <coughs> How come we're four months over? Yes, we, we did try and bring it to a previous council meeting, but we had to drop that off and um, timings and uh, the length of the meetings. And yeah. it, was, it was going to be brought earlier. <laughs> Um, actually, and just speaking of that, um, being able to have like a revolving board, uh, we, we've had some lengthy good discussion too with Jo. She did come along and do a presentation around that. Uh, I, I, I was pretty sure that they had or had talked about doing a policy up around that. But So I think that's for their CCLs. So, oh, yeah, oh, so okay. we, we have to defer that out to hold right. on. Yes. Okay. I knew I knew we were engaged in a conversation yeah. around that, so it was to the CCAs. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. I agree with that. Um, any, any other questions here guys? Councillors okay. Um someone like to move that A council receive the report and B 
Council resolves to extend the current Western Holdings Limited Director's appointments for a third three-year term. Councillor Davidson, Councillor Neil, those in favour? Aye. And you, just your worship, could we could we just note in a, as an action point those two actions around us critiquing our director appointment policy to ensure that it's staged in the future and we consider an internship on holdings? And that comes, we'll comes this, back. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Now the next one's really interesting. It's uh, animal dog control policies and practices, pages 24 to 30, and uh, Tiara. Thank you, Worship and Councillors. Um, I will generally take the representatives here, but as it states in the report, getting the annual report in terms of practices for year. And if there are any questions, uh, please advise. I'll uh, open it for discussion. Uh, Paul. Um, just a simple question about um, what's the status of the, the um, SPCA facility and use of that for the, the pound? Uh, in terms of the lease that council holds, it continues and even if the building was sold, just as we have with other buildings we've purchased, so the pound is ours. Uh, basically, for the next seven years, I think we have remaining in, in the lease to be able to use that as a pound facility for council and control the buildings. But in terms of the SPCA, there has been no conversation with them in the last six months in terms of the intent on the future use of the building. Hopeless, isn't it? What a waste of a good facility. Yes. It's all by the community. Mm -hmm. um, huge expense. Yeah. I can talk all to that briefly. Scraping, all the scraping and saving that went into that. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what about so, uh, Council Martin? you wish to say something there? I just wanted to respond to Paul. I, I echo his sentiment. Um, I understand that through correspondence that um, Minister has had with them, that they are considering com consulting with the local community before Christmas in terms of um, what the community would like to see done with that facility. So um, I think it's really critical that council's actually part of that conversation with its interest in dog control and animal stock control as well. So I'm just flagging that, that it, it might be worthwhile for us to actually reach out to them as well and say, can we please have a conversation? Yeah. Any other questions? Any other yeah, I'm going to come back to my question. I think I may have asked the very same thing last year. Why is there a difference between what dogs pay in town out to Canary and what rural dogs pay? Why? Only because of the zone that they're in. So it's the finest part of the district plan as to whether you're in an urban township zone. Or you're in a rural zone. So those of us, unfortunately, inclusive of myself, we consider rural being out in Canary, which means that you pay a lesser fee than people do when they're within the urban zone. But depending where you sit on one side of the road or the other, one side of Canary Road is deemed to be urban and the other side is deemed to be rural. Well, can can that not be reviewed? Because I just think it's because I and I yeah, I mean I have a friend that lives just out on Canary Road and she's at you know, she just lived a little bit further down the road. I mean, it just makes no sense to me why there has to be such a difference in price. And because the other thing I was going to question as well, like I see there's been a significant decrease in the amount of, you know, with the dog control officer that they've had to go, you know, of work that they've had to do. I'm not really sure how that income works versus the income coming in from dog registrations because I mean, is that considered a full-time role? It talks about him and then having an after hours, but you know, noticeably there's not as much, there doesn't appear to be as much work around the dog control. I just don't see why there's not just generally over the board a, a price for, for all dog owners. I think the difficulty with that Discussion is that it's under fees and charges, and this is uh, dog control policies and practices. So it's kind of a different discussion that it, needs to take place. That would be correct, Your Worship, but it's something we can note as part of discussion around the annual plan process. 
and when we're setting fees and charges and budgets later on this year for next year's annual plan, yeah. it is the opportunity yeah. for council then to determine if they want to see a change in fees and charges. Yeah, I, I'd like, yeah, that would be, that would be great. Um, yeah. So is it a full-time position? Yes, it is. And it's not just about responding to complaints. It's about going right from one end of the district to the other. So it's a full-time 40-hour week position in terms of the primary dog control officer. And then that person does a split shift in terms of hours as well. So it's normally two weeks on, two weeks off for after hour calls with people coming about roaming dogs, dog attacks and other things that happen after hours as well. And that can be anywhere from 7 p.m. at night through to 7 a.m. in the morning. And it does occur. But council is required to provide a response for anything that happens after hours in relation to dogs. Council Kennedy. Hey, TC, uh, just uh, one question about, um, you mentioned in, in the past about uh, perhaps having someone in South Westland uh, maybe to be able to respond to complaints. I know, obviously, Ocarito is a, a long way from Hokitika to be able to respond to complaints in a timely manner, whether it be dogs or wandering stock or anything like that. Has any work been done there or...? Uh, yes, there is currently. Um, as council may or may not be aware, our animal control officer resigned um, just before COVID. So we've been advertising for that and his partner was also the after hours um, responder as well. So we're looking at a potential change in the mix of delivery of service. But at the moment, we have only advertised a full time position. And then once that's in place, look at the options for us in terms of potential southwestern appointment. Thank you. Any other discussion there, councillors? Oh, yeah, just, um, look, I know you, you've got to fill out that report. Uh, you're required to do that, and, you, and you've done that. Uh, but um, overall, how's it all going? Oh, I can do more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, in terms of dog control, generally it's, it's going very well. Obviously, there's still an issue around roaming dogs. Um, but as you'll see, there is a reduction in numbers in terms of overall complaints. What we would like to think to put that down to, because we don't know whether it's just people not contacting council to make complaints, but what we'd like to think on the positive flip side is that's through education that we've had with people, better understanding that their responsibilities with dogs, um, and the same in terms of barking dogs, people being educated on to how not let your got dog or your young puppies get bored to annoy the neighbours. And much of what we do have in terms of Barking dogs are the recidivist ones, so it's, it's those that normally are away all day or at night because the dogs are used to having people around. Welfare um, has increased, but a lot of that was actually an increase in people leaving dogs in their vehicles over the Christmas period when we actually had a hot sweltering period. Um, and then there's others that have just been left in backyards, tethered and not fed, no shelter or food. Most of those get passed on to the SPCA. It's not something that we're able to resolve um, in discussions. And the general has dropped down, although we do know from a report that was in the Property for Guardian and Grey Star that there had been increase in terms of dog defecation along walking trails, but we weren't receiving those complaints through our system. So it's not to say there's less happening, but not everybody is ringing to... They may just see that as a minor issue in general. Um, one of the other things that may have also led to a reduction in complaints is those who are on Facebook. There are Facebook pages such as Book Ticket Grapevine um, or Lost Pets, and people are actually taking dogs into their care and advising through there, does anyone know who this dog is or have you seen my dog, which means it's not going through the, the council system either. So it's not requiring the officer to necessarily go out, pick up a dog and go through the whole enforcement but generally it's going well um, the issue for us is as has been touched on the need for the after hours cover and ensuring that we'd be appointing the right position people to those positions thank you, thank you to say um, sorry the um did i read in there about the number of dogs that went through the pound that have been rehomed um which was basically all of them that were not returned to their owners Rehome, that, is uh, that re, a re, rehome means actually to another home. Is that a euphemism? For no, people? no, it's not. Oh, no, okay. so <laughs> in <ter> of, <laughs> if they're euthanised, we will actually stay in there in terms of euthanised. Mm. Um, we're quite fortunate in terms of having had 
good agreements with SBA in the past, and that's not just in terms of through the grey office, it's been taking them through to Nelson and places like that as well. So there's been a case where we've managed to actually go through other facilities plus other dog um, saving places, and they have literally found a new forever home, not the last I'm time. pleased to hear that because, I mean, usually you think of the pound as a one-way ticket. No. No, very yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I've just seen another little follow up here on this. Um, how many dogs do we register in the Western District? We register, well, in terms of known registered, which is showing in the, the list, um, 1,400 and something here. Yeah. Yeah. So, of 1,400, we only have 64 approved responsible dog owners. That's correct. Of fourteen hundred, you make an application for that. So that's yeah. Well, I was sort of just wondering. I think that's more a case of that. There's a lot of people out there that don't, and it's just made me think: Do we need to do some sort of a media thing or raise that again over our district council site or in the media or something? You know, just to remind people. You know that it's to their benefit to come in and actually, because that's is it that's, cheaper for them? Hey? Is it cheaper for them? Not in the first year, um, but in but subsequent it, years. It yeah, is. I don't think it makes it last that long. <laughs> <laughs> but if we're going to have something like a responsible dog owner in place, I think we just we need to be able to get that message out there. Invite a councillor to move. A, council receive the report. B, council adopt the annual dog control policy and practices report for the year ended 30th of June 2021. C, the adopted annual dog control policy and practices report for the year in 30th of June 2021 be publicly notified and made publicly available on council's website. And D, the Secretary for Local Government has advised that the annual dog control policy and practices report for the year <coughs> ended 30th of June 2021 has been pub published in accordance with Section 10A of the Dog Control Act 1996 and Section 5.1 of the Local Government Act 2002. I have a move. That's a meal. Thank you, Councillor Davidson. Those in favour? Aye. Thank you. We go on to the next one, which is um, Smoke Free and Vape Free Environments Policy 2021, Council Buildings and Public Spaces. It's on pages 31 to 35 of your agenda. Thank you, Councillors. Uh, once again, I will take the report as read. The primary driver for the changes to the policy, as pointed out, is due to the changes in the actual Smoke Free Environments Act 1990 that occurred. Uh, late last year in November um, and as you will recall we did have two submissions from Community and Public Health West Coast and Active West Coast that also asked that we amend that our policy to reflect bait free because that's what the amendments have done within the Smoke Free Environments Act. So the policy is basically in the form that it was as a smoke free policy and the amendments have only been include, uh, made to include the requirement for bait free to be part of a smoke free policy as well. For discussion. I think. Hmm. I've read it and I'm happy to move that it be adopted. The um, community and public health and active West Coast, I mean they submit on all of these these things, aren't they the same people? Well they're two separate groups, but they're achieving the same aims. Oh, another way of saying it's the same people. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, no, that's fine. But um, yeah, look, I, I um, fully agree with this. I mean, um, it's no more pleasurable to get a blend full of fruit flavoured vape um, <laughs> as to get a blend full of cigarette smoke. I can't uh, get rid of both of them. And then I will invite a uh, councillor to A, uh, resolve to A, uh, the council receive the report and B, the Council adopt the amended smoke free and vape free environments policy, council buildings and public spaces 2021, as attached in this report, Appendix 1. Do I have a move? 
Councillor Neil, thank you. Councillor Hart, those in favour? Aye. Move on to the next item of the agenda, which is responsible camping funding. It's on pages 36 to 38 of your agenda. And Scott. Um, as you know, I'll take the uh, report as read and I will take any questions that anybody has. Thank you, Scott. It seems rather simple. The funding is no longer there. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I will open it for discussion. So anyone that wishes to raise a question? I was really looking forward to roaming around Westland for nothing this summer, but obviously that won't be happening. You still can. You just need to buy a public toilet. Probably self-contained. Yeah. I'd invite uh, the councillor to to uh, move that A, Council receive the report, and B, the facilities at Freedom Camping Sites, that's toilets and rubbish bins, are closed or removed for the 2021-22 Freedom Camping season, excluding any site where, a business operator, where business operators have agreed to absorb costs as specified in a memorandum of understanding. Councillor Cogan, thank you. Councillor I'll second it. Oh, yeah. All those in favour? Aye. Okay. I'm just going to copy. Okay. Now move into public excluded. Uh, to those that have um, sat through today's meeting, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Um, and I'll now move that Council moves into the public excluded section and request.